Out of the gates and ready to go. Outkick 360 is back. Thursday edition. Just like that. Thursday's here. Weekend on the horizon. And we have a great show planned. NFL discussion about to happen. College football and SEC talk with Trey Wallace. Armando Salguero brings us news and notes from across the league. Uh, both Trey and Armando with Outkick. And they'll join us today on 360. Sixth and Peabody, our location with Yeehaw Beer and Old Smoky Moonshine. Gentlemen, good morning. I am good ready, afternoon. ready to go. It's, uh, it was it's an early morning. morning for you, Hutton. So, uh, well, same for you. Still in, the, still in the morning uh, mode. I say that uh, more often than I like. When you say good afternoon, I, sh- I feel like I should correct you to say morning. And I'm when, I'm the I first, when I'm the first person uh, awake on any given day, really, it's... Uh, well, that should make it's it feel more morning. like afternoon. Sh- it's a big morning. You sure, you're, time you sure you're up before me this morning? <laughs> no, I'm saying my, under my roof. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a big day. Um, um, you beat the dog even? It's, yeah, uh, well, that's not hard. Uh, Brody, uh, Brody can sleep. It's, it's late afternoon, but we hope to bring a morning energy <laughs> to the show today. Morning. To where we that's right. really, you know, we're the, the, uh, the old morning zoo. Yeah, let's just really get the energy up uh, to, on today's show. Man, that's I, what we're trying to do. They, so I, I went out to uh, training camp. Paul was out there. Stay. Chad came in early, and we have a conversation. He has a conversation with Bobby Lashley. SummerSlam in town uh, this Saturday in uh, Nashville in Music City, and uh, he will join us. Former, uh, was he a Army cadet? He was a sergeant. He was a sergeant. Yeah, he reached the rank of sergeant. And the then um, went into pro wrestling, went to MMA, back to pro wrestling. Bobby Lashley on the show in about an hour. Looking forward to that. We mentioned Trey and Armando uh, always bring uh, the top news from SEC and NFL uh, headlines. So uh, going to be a lot of fun today. Um, Rick Flair was a blast today. He was out at uh, Titans training camp and... It never, like, every time I see him in a setting, he, I, I don't know if he's ever been in a room where someone doesn't know who he is. Um, or if you just walk into any room right now and ask, have you heard of Ric Flair? The answer is yes. And he's in his 70s. My grandfather, um, on my dad's side, grew up loving the guy. And uh, that was his era. And then every generation, uh, even right now, You've got NFL players wanting to take pictures with the guy because you've got rappers naming songs after him. He's hanging out with Rick Ross in South Beach. Um, and he has his final match in Nashville on Sunday. He was in town at Titans practice. Good share of the Titans were very fired up to see him. And any time, I mean, it's only second day of camp, right? But it'd yeah. be better if he was in the middle of camp. But anything that breaks up what's going to be a monotonous camp. You're right. Um, is good, and he'll he'll rate right there with uh, visits from the Bucks and the Cards, in terms of something that was was different. They played his entrance know. music whenever he yeah. walked out on the field to give his speech. Yeah, well and there's done. been uh, you know older things. I'm not calling him a thing. He is a human being, but <laughs> older things that have been adopted by uh, the hip hop community. I think of like the movie Scarface and his reference in a lot of songs. Ric Flair is one of those older things that's referenced in a lot of hip hop culture. Yeah. So uh, I I can't think in the wrestling world, in terms of just name recognition today, Hulk Hogan, Ric Flair. I mean, who's who's next? He did not like Derrick Henry at Alabama, uh, and he <laughs> did not expect this career out of Derrick Henry in the NFL. But Derrick Henry is now his favorite NFL player. He said. I love that Ric Flair just has an answer to everything. everything. He just goes in depth. You know, I didn't really like I didn't like his film coming out of Alabama. I didn't think it was going to last, <laughs> but he just goes right into it. If you ask him a question about Derrick Henry, I love that. Uh, we will hit uh, all of the training camp headlines over the next three hours. There's plenty to get to. The first big injury uh, has hit practice uh, uh, in Tampa bad. Bay where uh, Jensen, their starting center, was uh, carted off the field today. Surrounded Ryan Surrounded by his teammates. Um, doesn't sound good. And uh, that's a key cog in the operation there, Ryan Jensen. So um, you hope the best, but doesn't, doesn't sound good. No. And that, that's, a, that's the front line for Tom Brady and the protection and all the calls that the line's making. Brady's making adjustments. You need the veteran center in the mix there. And uh, Jensen has been a uh, a fixture 
on the offensive front, even prior to Brady getting there. And Ali Marpet retired during yeah. the offseason, so they've got some turnover, uh, potentially more than they wanted uh, or expected. Um, uh, impromptu presser from Kyler Murray. Um, the quarterbacks are speaking once a week now, right? Mandatory? Pretty much, or maybe Roughly. once every five days. So, I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, did he speak yesterday and today? Because he just signed the contract, so I'm trying to figure out if, if how impromptu it really was. But he made a point from the jump to uh, discuss the contract. We're going we're gonna to hear that in just a moment. But this has been – this has taken over the discussion. While everyone waits on Deshaun Watson – and the suspension news to come down. Attention has turned to Kyler Murray based on the four-hour study clause within the contract. Study. Independent In, study. Independent That's study. That's all the rage now, independent study. <laughs> on your own as a starting An quarterback. independent studies major. Yeah. Maybe he w once was in college. So if you are just randomly tuned in to one of our great radio partners right now and you haven't heard, uh, so the, Murray has the contract extension with the Arizona Cardinals. And within that is a clause that he must study on his own at least four hours a week to prepare for the upcoming game. And that has turned into wildfire in discussion over the last 24 to 48 hours. And Murray took to the podium in front of the Arizona media today and said this. To think that I can accomplish everything that I've accomplished in my career um, and not be a student of the game and not, um, not, not have that passion and not, not take this serious is, is almost, it's disrespectful and it's, it's, almost, it's, it's almost a joke. Here's what he said seven months ago to the New York Times. I think I was blessed with the cognitive skills to just go out there and just see it before it happens. I'm not one of those guys that's just going to sit there and kill myself watching film. I don't sit there for 24 hours and break down this team and that team and watch every game because... In my head, I see so much. So look, you're being very defensive for a guy that was pretty flip about your need to really dive in before. And you just signed a contract that has a page in it where you agreed to something Andrew Brandt, a former agent and a former executive with the Green Bay Packers, who's done contracts on both sides, said he's never seen in 30 years a thing where you're contractually bound to do four hours of independent study a week that can be monitored by the team through iPads that they control, which is, is for all intents and purposes, presumed for every other quarterback in the league. Four hours, I would say, Hut, for a lot of quarterbacks, a lot more than four oh, hours. Oh, I mean, this is, uh, it's ridiculous that it's four hours. I mean, I don't think people realize just how little that is in the grand Most scheme of Most quarterbacks... Things are at the facility on Tuesday, which is an off day, getting the game plan, uh, first off, having a voice in the game plan, secondly, getting it, quote-unquote, hot off the presses to go home Tuesday night, which is an off night. Sometimes they're getting some stuff Monday night, but Tuesday night, which is an off night, to get a head start so that when the coaches are installing it on Wednesday, they're part of the installation because they already know. They already know it. In the you can't just you can't just make this stuff up department. Kyler Murray delivered that address to the media while wearing a shirt that said "Easy Money." On it. <laughs> That's great. That's like this uh, is just like Josh Reynolds. Yeah, what, what was, was he wearing? Shirt? What 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 do you have on his shirt uh, when he was know, some talking about? Shirt. It's uh, talking about a conflicting it. message. Yeah. he's talking about how hard he's worked his entire career and how dare you ever question anything that I've done. And then he's wearing a shirt that says "Easy" and the "S" is a money is a dollar symbol. Uh, and easy. Look, I, I get what he's saying. I mean, you're not going to reach that level without some some work ethic to be a starting quarterback that's had any success in the NFL. And I do think a lot of it does. It comes naturally to him, and I'm sure there's preparation involved. This is where the Arizona Cardinals could really help him out by saying something, I anything. Well, if they came out and just said Kingsbury ran this from isn't, it. Said this he had isn't, nothing to do. With I know it. the K Kingsbury did, but Kingsbury could easily run from it because he said, "I don't do the contracts." I don't work with that. I, I was just sitting there praying that they would get it done. Kingsbury. I don't sign the contracts. But even if the Cardinals wanted to leak something out to the media and say, look, this has nothing to do with Kyler Murray. We're just now putting this in any quarterback contract moving forward. It's got nothing to do with his history. If they wanted to say anything to attempt to let him off the hook, there are multiple ways they could do that. They don't have to call a big press conference and do it. They could text Adam Schefter. 
or any other contact and say, this is our side of this contract and why it's in there. And yes, it is something of a rarity right now, like Andrew Brandt said, for contracts in the NFL, but we want to make this the standard for quarterback contracts moving forward with some of this language when we sign quarterbacks with this organization. There's a lot of ways, guys, they could frame this to help out Kyler Murray. They may not care. They're probably sitting back thinking this is all going to go away soon, which as we know in this news cycle probably will. But if he struggles, it's probably not going to go away. This is probably something that's going to creep back up during the season. Well, also, though, there is a bit of overreaction to all this. Um, The guy that took the podium today that apparently doesn't study is the first athlete in history to be a first-round pick in both the Major League Baseball and NFL draft. He did both. Um, He won a Heisman Trophy, threw for nearly 5,000 yards that season. Um, The media that's criticizing him now wanted to go ahead and give him the MVP trophy seven weeks into the season last year. That's how good he was. So the the oh. idea that he's Jamarcus Russell or Johnny Manziel, well, he is what not. If he's, that's uh, exactly okay. What if he's Vince Young? Vince well, Young won a Heisman Trophy. He was a great player at Texas. I think he went to two Pro Bowls early on. He was terrible in the playoffs. Explain I, to me where Kyler Murray's different from Vince Young right now through this point of their career. I agree with you. It's the being exaggerated. It's being exaggerated well, that, that he's Jamarcus Russell. I agree with you absolutely. But, but nobody, the team extended him gets, with a very odd clause yes. in it about four hours of independent study. I agree. Talking about. But nobody but the, awards an MVP but, but, award but after seven weeks of no, the season. His full body guys, work was insufficient. Please. I, I spend four hours every two nights preparing for a show. Like, Four out, like the idea that four hours of film study is going to make some sort of difference in the Arizona well, Cardinals season is. is ridiculous to me. This is like bare minimum effort for a guy that clearly, based on how they can track these iPads that they send home with, I say iPads, they're like the Microsoft whatever, um, they're tracking screen time. And the, they, it, the it, guy clearly never turned it on. And he would have done that from training camp last year, the training camp prior, to the final stretch of the season last year. And this all goes back to what I just said. The Cardinals could easily help him out by saying, he studies way more than this during the week. That is a bare minimum thing that we're just now putting into contracts. It says nothing about his work ethic. They could easily make this go away with one text message to a major NFL newsmaker where they state their side of it. So two thing, there's only two things odd to me about this because they paid him the big money. They clearly believe in him. They clearly believe in his work ethic and everything else. Then why the clause? This is like a few good men. Why, why the two orders? Why the clause put in there that's very rare and unique? And then why not just come out now after it gets this media dust up going and just say, instead of having him go up there and defend himself and say all this stuff about don't question my work ethic, it's disrespectful, just release it through a source and say, guys, nothing to see here. This is going to be standard practice moving forward for that. And he, he studies way more than this. They've bungled it, I think. They've bungled it. I don't buy that they're completely confident in it. I think teams give deals too often to a guy that's a wishful thing, trying to get ahead of it, rooting for him to have a big season, but not confident that he will. Well, I don't, I don't know waited. why, though, Paul, if you're the Cardinals – that you would sign a guy to make this commitment to him and then let it get out there about this clause and not defend it, not defend well, him at all. Well, because he Cardinals, is now your he is They're now not your the most guy. functional organization but I'm in the saying league. They've he, gotten better. He is your guy now. So you should well, do everything you can to their, protect him. He's their guy on a Derek Carr contract, is what it's he is. Three years. It's a three year, hundred five million dollar guarantee on whatever this ends up being, two hundred and something right. total. Um, so he's not going to see the end of the deal. And uh, quite frankly, Kingsbury may not either, but they just extended him and the general manager through 2027, I believe. Was they're the doing year. a lot of hopeful spending. But they're, they're also, uh, they could end up looking really good if they end up doing the spending now instead of spending more later, which is what a lot of teams just sit back and wait and wait on the extra year. And normally, if you wait, you normally lose the player or you're spending more 12 months from now than what you would be spending at the present time. It's all about if he's good or not. It's a so roll of the it's dice. It's just, uh, again, I, I'm not saying that I have any answers on this or that I, I know the definitive reason for all of it. It's just very odd to me that we're, we're sitting here in Nashville with a franchise 
that is very typically, they don't say a lot, but you would think with their head coach in Mike Vrabel and John Robinson, very no-nonsense, old-school, do-your-job, show-up, no-excuses guys. And they sat there and made excuses for their number one pick about not being in shape for a while. They did that to protect him. I understand why they're doing it. They don't want to break a guy's confidence right away because he made a mistake by not showing up immediately in shape. He got himself in shape, came back to camp. He'll be ready for the season. Great. But they went out of their way as an organization to protect a first-round wide receiver. Then why, oh, why are the Cardinals just sitting back and letting everyone speculate about this clause that they, that they first, they put in the contract, and second, they're, now they're not saying anything to defend their guy. Instead, they're putting him up there well, to podium they're kind of putting it for all him on to defend him. himself. They're kind of putting, we gave you the money. You defend yourself on the clause, go out and perform. It's not the best way of operation, but that's what they're doing. Again, part of me's thinking, well, I, I, I like the honesty we signed him and hung of being him out to silent, <laughs> putting it in there and saying, you can read into it as you want mm-hmm. as to what we think about his and independent you study habits. But and you like, answer for it, Kyla. The, the idea that four hours is making a, like that, I, I, you spend, I we spend more time in our cars on every given week than what Kyler sure. Murray has to guarantee the team he'll spend well, studying. I don't well, that think, says I don't, something I don't to me. That's hear, a bare minimum, and they have that's, to contractualize that's it. I don't hear many people coming out and saying that four hours is going to be the difference between success and failure. It, to me, it's way more about the message it sends to everyone that they felt it necessary to include a, a measly baseline. four hours baseline in a contract that's not in many other contracts that we know of, if any. That's out there. So why the need? It was only newsworthy because, because it's it's different. Well, because it's they're, not track, there they're tracking what, that device that he takes home with him that he never apparently turned on. I mean that yeah. that's that's what that comes down to. But I mean they'll they'll settle for four when they should need six, eight, twelve. That's that that's a bad sign to me. But that that they, they, they I mean like to they, me they're to settling me, for four like. He's he's really good without doing anything, quite frankly. Sometimes. And whenever he, you know, turns on this, he said that, you know, he doesn't. I mean, he, his father is a quarterback coach and makes a living doing that in North Texas. And if Kyler Murray was running an offense at nine years old that was four wide, with four wide receivers. So this idea that he, you know, didn't grow up studying the game. I mean, he grew up with a coach. So the... The whole thing about how he just shows up and plays like it's street ball, I don't find that to be the case either. Um, but the, the four-hour thing, I mean, literally they could have said in the, in the same text, and just insert text here on the contract, please turn on your device four times a week instead of four hours a day, and you'll get that done. We spent more time on HR tests for Fox than what he is having to do studying for an NFL defense per week. Money makes, you, money makes you more of what you are. And I think they have fears about what he is. Well, the, the, their biggest fear was losing him. Otherwise, they wouldn't sign him now. They didn't think he was going to play the season on the current deal, apparently. It's just very sign weird because I feel like they could just make this go away if they wanted to. Well, And, and they're they, not. I mean, they could, they could easily leak some story out and just say, this is why we did it. It's nothing personal with him. We've got these tracking devices now. We're going to do it with a lot of people. He's fine. He I prepares. Wouldn't I wouldn't buy it, would you? But, I mean, at least they're well, just no not they're letting – I mean, it's, it's no better one than saying nothing. nothing until the clause news came right. out. Right, yeah. All right. Th- that's, when the sto- that's when the story came but out. But my, my thing is, like, it, the clause isn't going to make a difference one way or the other. If you're committing to him for $100 million in the short term, that when I say they – I'm. Kime and Kingsbury are married to Kyler Murray. Absolutely. So it's either you're in or you're out. There's none of this, oh, we need you to study more. Oh, by the way, though, here's the hundred million during the era of you not studying for everything you did for the franchise. Well, while you're in, you could ask him to change going forward. We're giving you a hundred million dollar contract for what we expect you to do, and what we expect you to do is have better study happen. But if you're, and what you're I'm saying, saying they're, they're not all in, season. that looks that's worse on the Cardinals well, than what it is well, I Kyler think Murray. it's bad on the Cardinals. What I'm saying is they are in with their financial commitment, so be all in and get a story out there on the other side that doesn't make this as big of a deal. It's very easy to do. If you wanted to, if you're the Cardinals, instead of just sitting back and letting the media pick it apart as 
This is the Cardinals saying you don't work hard enough away from practice and the facility. Well, the, the, other, thing, the other thing there, too, who do you go to for the definitive tone of the franchise in Arizona? Is it Kime or is it Kingsbury? Because it can't be both. It's not both. Um, there's one guy that speaks every day and one guy that is required to speak every now and then to the, to the press corps. Yeah, in season, it should, well, be, this is, it should be Kingsbury. Kingsbury defaulted to the front office yeah, this is a, But this is totally a Kime question. It's got to be on him to say it, not Kingsbury. Kingsbury's not in their drafting contracts. So, I mean, I believe Kingsbury when he says, I'm not working out the well, language of the contract. He's not drafting contracts, but he, it's his offense. He's, got he, input. he's the play caller. He's the guy that needs the quarterback studying in he's order the to one. be prepared for the, what guess. he's drawn up, like you're saying. Yeah. Either way, it was a terrible game plan that he put together. I like Kingsbury to study more on that game plan he put together against the Rams. Yeah, it was bad. But they weren't – I mean, they're not beating the Rams on that last year in that setting, I don't think. Kyler should uh, respond by saying, you know, I, the, in the four hours I've been studying this week, uh, other receivers that will come in to replace Hopkins while he's out for Kirk. six games. And Kirk, yeah. I don't love what I've seen in my four hours of study from our other receivers. <laughs> let's, yeah, let's that's what he should there. do. He should turn it into a joke the rest of the season. That'd be pretty good. Yeah, I mean, uh, what Kingsbury hindsight would have, it would have been great if he just says, oh, yeah, I, it's also in my contract that I have to study four hours a week. I like. It, I'm not Just play it off and move on. I'm not Kyler Murray's agent, but I'd be working that deal for four hours of football, a podcast with uh, Kyler Murray right now, where it's just four hours a week in the off season, and that's it. And that's his that's his podcast, four hours on. What something. else do we do more than four hours a week? That's just very simple. Like just that's what I'm comparing this to. It's not that much. It's really not that much uh, of time at all there. Which again just makes it even stranger that they would feel compelled to put it in the contract chad i need you to drink get it one glass of water per day in order to work i don't here. drink enough water i'll tell you that much my doctor says the same thing i need to be more hydrated hit us up on social media with your take at outkick 360 we're going to hydrate during the break and then uh the the always ready and prepared and study and well studied is trey wallace of outkick.com with the sec we'll dive in on all of the southeastern conference news and notes coming up should we start with drinkwitz uh, that's what I, I wanted to ask a question about. We'll start with old yeah. Eli. Eli. Elijah. Eli. Is it Elijah or Elias? I think it's Elias. I think you're right. <laughs> I, like I think Elias. it's actually I Elias. I prefer Elias. Yeah. No S. That's Elia. Elia. Right. There you go. I, I don't like that. Aurora <laughs> Nutriscience is something we like. Vitalifescience.com is the website. V-I-D-A-Lifescience.com. It's where you can see more information our Outkick 360 season ticket holders receive 15% off with the discount. The code is Outkick360 for all of the great supplements they have for you. The vitamin C, the D3, curcumin, and more. Typical pills and capsules, not well absorbed. In fact, most are only absorbed in small, very small amounts. Your digestive system breaks these pills down until there's little left for you to benefit. But here is Aurora, unique, cutting-edge, nutritional, and absorbable supplements encapsulated in liposomes that ensure greater absorption in the body's bloodstream. Visit VitaLifeScience.com for more info. 15% off with the code OUTKICK360. V-I-D-A. VitaLifeScience.com.
Trey Wallace is with OutKick.com. We're talking SEC headlines on OutKick 360. Trey, Eli Drinkwitz did not make major headlines a week ago at SEC Media Days, but he did whenever he joined Jim Rome, roasting Tennessee over recruiting and recent recruiting violations. Uh, quite the big talk for uh, Coach Drinkwitz, who lost by quite the big number last season. Yeah, Jonathan, good to join you guys. I, I found it interesting. I mean, he, he said he was going back and he was looking for a win uh, that maybe Tennessee would vacate, uh, which was kind of interesting. And, and like, I, I understand, like, the Tennessee fans are like, ah, oh, why is Eli Drinkwood's talking about us? But it was it was brought up and, like, you know, he's really making fun of Jeremy Pruitt yeah. and his wife for being involved in these recruiting uh, violations at the NCAA allege. I, you know... You got to have off-season headlines. I think that's the big thing. Um, at least do a little bit of talking. Eli Drinkwitz is not scared uh, to to kind of go out and, and and make fun of others. I mean, you, you guys all remember. <laughs> I love it. I mean, you guys remember. Well, when, when remember when they beat Florida in overtime, and he comes out, you know, with his coat can and his dark Vader, yeah. uh, you know, little stick, and he says, you know what? May the force be with you. Uh, and, and I know, I know, lightsaber. Uh, but he pretty much took the final shot at Dan Mullen after he was fired. So Eli Drinkwitz is not scared to mess around in the SEC. He just better start winning. I mean, are are they? Is there any threat of them winning uh, this year or <laughs> anytime soon? Like that's the weird thing about it is I maybe he's got some quiet confidence for a reason that I, I don't understand. But I don't look at their roster and what they have coming back and see anything better than a spot ahead of Vandy. Uh, in the SEC East. Is, is this a team that's going to improve this year? I mean, Chad, I, I, look, when you lose somebody like Tyler Brady at running back, uh, you, you're taking away most of your offense. Like, I, I understand that they have Cook and they've got Macon at quarterback and Sam Horn, who's still dealing with some stuff with MLB if he comes in. But, but I, you know, I, I think Missouri is just going to be, you know, right above Vanderbilt. They're going to be – there's so many, I think – potentially good teams in the sec east this year that i think that missouri is going to be that one that's sitting towards the bottom with vanderbilt just because of the way their schedule lines up and what they lost on offense it's hard to replace one of the top running backs in the southeastern conference and, and when you were getting so much production from him last year good luck trying to replace it they we'll did see. they did win three conference games over the backstretch after getting boat raced by tennessee and georgia and the Kentucky game was among the top games in the conference, just possession for possession early in the season. So uh, they're, they're going to be competitive in the middle tier. I'm with Chad and you, Trey, that they ultimately, I, I would predict them, I would vote them up just ahead of Vandy. But I think that they get there in a much different way than the way Vanderbilt will get to the bottom of the SEC East in that regard. That, I think they'll be more competitive because I just watched them be more competitive than what I thought well, they would be. Two games early, Trey, that they, they host Louisiana Tech, who I believe is terrible coming into this year on a yeah. Thursday night, but then they go to Manhattan, Kansas to take on Kansas State in week two, and then their first SEC game is at Auburn in, on September 24th. So two games in September that, to me, look eminently winnable yeah. for, for Missouri that – if they get those two, they're four and zero, oh, and and look out. If they lose both, then maybe the opposing coach is going to be wearing the Darth Vader helmet <laughs> in the post game <laughs> well, press go, conference. Go, hey, go to, go to Kansas State, pull out a win, and then go down to Auburn. And we don't know what Auburn's going to look like. Like, you know, they, they've got Penn State coming down uh, to Jordan Hare Stadium. You know what? What's Auburn going to look like a quarterback? Are they going to roll with Zach Calzada, T.J. Finley? That one is going to be intriguing to me. So if if Missouri can can somehow sneak in there, you know, play well on offense, that that's a game that potentially is winnable. But like you're going to see a lot of these SEC games this year where you would say, "Oh, well, this might be a blowout," but it turns out to be a really good game. I think you're going to see that this season, and and one of those could be Missouri playing Auburn. You wrote an interesting piece about how we're maybe not that far off in revisionist history from seeing Stetson Bennett. Uh, actually suit up for Billy Napier at Florida right now. Give us the backstory on that one. Yeah, you know, it was very interesting. Uh, when, when Stetson Bennett was at Georgia uh, that first year, you know, he was running scout team, um, and, and he decided, look, I'm, I'm not getting any playing time here. I'm going to go to Jones County Community College, which is, guys, if, if you've watched Netflix, you know, the last chance you, that first two or three seasons, uh, and Scuba, 
Mississippi. That's pretty much what Stetson was dealing with, but on like the lower scale in Jones County. But he put he put up some impressive numbers in like five games, and and Billy Napier was intrigued. And he Billy Napier was at Louisiana Lafayette, Louisiana now, but Louisiana Lafayette at the time, and he wanted him to come play quarterback. And uh, and if it, it he was all going to sign, and I've talked to a couple people about this on the Florida staff now that were at you know Louisiana at the time, and. Uh, he was in the bag. It was done. Uh, he was going to sign that morning. And then Kirby Smart gave him a phone call. And they had been staying in connection, you know, a little bit. But they called him up and said, hey, man, you want to come back to Georgia? And and the interesting part about this is, you know, his coach at the community college told him, don't go back to Georgia. You, you're going to go back and you're going to ride the bench and you're going to be playing behind Jake Fromm. Uh, don't do that. Go to Louisiana where you can pot- potentially be a starter. And uh, you know what? It, it's, that's a bit of – it was his dream to play in Georgia. I think he would have gone back there either way if Justin Fields wouldn't have left that December. I think everybody remembers when Fields left and the quarterback room got a little interesting. And Bennett goes back, and, and look what happens. I mean, three to four years later, he he led Georgia to a national championship. So I, I look at what Stetson Bennett done and has done in his journey – Man, it just makes the story even better, guys. And I I think that's the biggest part of of when you look at him. And um, this is going to be an interesting season for him because everybody knows what to expect out of Seth and Bennett this season. So how do defenses attack him? I I think this is one It could be intriguing for Georgia. There may be that. I'm potentially seeing a loss or two in there for the Bulldogs. Trey, I haven't had a chance to talk to you since Tennessee received their notice of allegations from the NCAA. And while there's 18 level one violations in that report, both sides are sort of gushing over the other one. You know, the NCAA saying this is the standard for how an institution should handle it. Tennessee handed over six or seven major violations that the NCAA didn't uncover on their own and gave it to the NCAA. Danny White's coming back and saying, we've done our due diligence. This is how you handle it. Now we're ready to move forward and not punish future and current student athletes. So with all of that out there, what are the odds that the NCAA comes back and gives Tennessee anything approaching the significance of a bowl ban moving forward? Or is this going to be a minor addition to what Tennessee's already self-imposed? I think that's pretty slim in talking with some folks of the last couple of days over at UT and the one or two folks uh, within the NCAA. Uh, for Tennessee getting a, a postseason ban. Um, I think, you know, Tennessee has done really well in trying to stay out in front of the NCAA and at least letting them know. I mean, last season, they went almost two months without hosting an official visitor on campus. Uh, they cut back on what Jai Schottel and his staff could do when it comes to off-campus recruiting. Tennessee Tennessee got ahead of this. They, they, they put a lot of restrictions in when it comes to recruiting, staying a below that 85 number and and I look at it and I I think it's smart I mean you know going forward I think Tennessee is going to stay under the 85 number I think they're going to keep some scholarships back and they're going to say hey you know NCAA this is what we're doing and by the way Tennessee is in constant contact and letting them know what they're doing when it comes to restrictions I, I think when you look at it overall you know the, the number of level one violations are very interesting to me. Um, I thought it could be a lot worse, to be honest with you. Um, but I think that what they found, and this is very key when it comes to Tennessee in this investigation, what they found after that month and a half period, you know, middle yeah. of November, all the way up until they, you know, they fired yeah. Jeremy Pruitt, they found a lot more after that period. And I, and I think that, and it's because they brought in a law firm to handle this type of stuff, but they found more to put on top and on top of what they had already discovered from Niedermeyer, from Pruitt, from Shelton Felton, other members of the staff, recruiting staff. And it came down to it where, you know, guys, they were, they were pretty much running a hotel scheme of the local hotel here in town. Uh, They're paying players. Jeremy Pruitt's wife is, is involved in paying players. Like, they're going to punish the folks that were involved in this. I don't think they're going to come as hard on Tennessee. I think Tennessee has done well enough to keep themselves above this little byline right here and say, okay, we've done our due. Now, you go handle Edemeyer, Pruitt, Casey Pruitt, if you like, Shelton Felton, and others. So I, 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 everybody thought the plan at first to like say, hey, NCAA, here's everything we got. 
have at it. Everybody thought that was a little sketchy at first, but it turns out it could be actually working out in Tennessee's favor. Trey, we're about to get uh, cranked up with the SEC practices, just like we have training camps going on across the NFL. Is there a quarterback battle that you feel like is above the rest? We've got one at Texas A&M, Auburn, LSU is intriguing because they're talking about four guys right now in the mix. Um, they haven't named a starter at South Carolina, but I think we know it's Rattler, so I'm removing that from the list. Maybe I shouldn't. You could tell me. Is there another one that you would put up there, and which one are you most intrigued to, to follow on a daily basis? You know, you just brought up South Carolina. Shane Beamer said today that Luke Dotty is healthy. Um, I don't really think that's going to matter. I think Spencer Rattler is your quarterback this season for South Carolina. You know, the one that intrigues me the most is what's Jimbo going to do down in College Station with Haynes King, or are you going to roll with Max Johnson, the transfer from LSU? Like, you know, this is a season where they have got to continue taking the right steps in that direction towards, okay, the college football playoff or, or battling for that spot in Atlanta. And I think it's so key for Jimbo to not screw this up. Because, you know, it's not his fault that Haynes King got out there and got hurt last year against Colorado. And then Zach Calzada comes in, and they limp their way, and then they beat Alabama, then they lose to Mississippi State. You can't have that this season. Their schedule lines up pretty nicely for, I think, personally, for for them to get 10 wins. Um, They they could potentially beat Miami in the month of September. Their quarterback battle intrigues me. I, I want to see what Jimbo does under the pressure here and puts, you know, does he go with what he was going to do last year with Haynes King? Or does he say, Max Johnson, boy, this kid's got a lot of talent. He could come in here and lead this squad. That's what I'm going to be watching. You know, I, I think the other one is, what does Brian Harson do at Auburn? Does he roll with Calzada or does he roll with T.J. Finley? Personally, I think it's going to be Zach Calzada. Uh, once they get through with fall camp, we'll see what Auburn does. I don't expect them to win over six to seven games this year. Um, so that's kind of a hit or miss situation. And then, you, you know, you kind of you kind of look around the conference and, and besides LSU, you know, there's a lot of teams that are pretty much settled. And, and, and we haven't seen that a lot in previous yeah. years where like they're, they're pretty much settled at quarterback, you know. And I think the biggest thing is, OK, preparing your backups, having them ready to go is going to be key for me. And, you know, we, we start off, you know, it's crazy that we're sitting here. We're talking about this now. So on Sunday. I'll head over to to Tennessee's campus and we'll cover them for media day. And and it's crazy to think last year we were talking about, well, Joe Milton's going to be the guy. Joe Milton's going to be the guy. And then Lyndon Hooker turned out to be the guy. I think you just need to watch that around some of these schools um, and and see how it plays out over the next four to five weeks. Uh, We'll be at Kentucky next week as well. Uh, Will Levis is the man up there. So some interesting battles, you know, around the conference and a lot of them, to be honest with you, are coming out of the SEC West. Trey Wallace, Outkick.com is where you can find the college football headlines and SEC discussion. Trey, thank you as always, man. Man, that went fast. Thanks. Guys, I appreciate it. Have fun interviewing Bobby Lashley. I'm kind of jealous and have fun at SummerSlam this weekend. The Almighty is coming up in a little over 15 minutes here on the show. We've got Bobby Lashley, Armando Salguero, and much more. We've got plenty of NFL headlines and a Withrow family member who is about to play on national television. We've got details on that next on Outkick 360.
WWE SummerSlam this Saturday. Bobby Lashley will join us in 10 minutes. Chad caught up with him earlier today in a good chat. He's in town. Their, their schedules amaze me. He's in town already. They're, they're actually, WWE's holding tryouts at the Wild Horse Saloon all week. Chad, you going? Um, no. And then I, need, I need to get in better shape. <laughs> they've got so that, after you and lose then, your 15. Yeah, they're you going go. to Atlanta and then back to Nashville. So they've got some Friday night in Atlanta? Yeah, Friday night SmackDown on Fox in Atlanta live, and then they'll be back here. It's a I'm surprised nuts. they've got. I, I mean, the same guys who are wrestling Friday night won't wrestle Sunday. Oh, will yeah, they? they will. Thanks. Saturday, Saturday, the Saturday, Saturday night. night is the event. It'll be the next day. I'm surprised by that. It's I crazy. Mean, they got the a full around. calendar. That's Most of the time, like sure. they're they're smart about it though. Just it, what I've noticed, uh, they will not wrestle the night before a pay-per-view, so there's no like last-minute injury. It's like a preseason game for the regular season game the next night. So they set up a promo, you know, and build the match. That's what they'll try to do anyway. I don't know about Lashley, though. We'll find out. Chad catches up with him in 10 minutes. Um, you can also catch a Withrow family member on national television in what is a run for a championship of the ages. This is thrilling. not not quite a Withrow, but uh, I'm I, calling I, him still, I still claim him. Elisha Knight, uh, my first cousin Nathan, who if you're watching, you can see the family right now. Andy not pictured in that, Nathan's awesome lovely range. wife. He's really mugging but it up But Elisha here. is Nathan's youngest son, and he is with Northwest Little League in Washington, D.C. My cousin Nathan is a pastor in the city of Washington, D.C. They won the... And my cousin Nathan puts the air quotes around it. He says, the state championship in Washington, D.C., because the District of Columbia being a state for Little League purposes. Okay. Uh, and this was crazy thrilling for me to watch. We had some downtime in Nebraska. My cousin sent a link to a game probably four games ago in this tournament to watch. And that's one of the amazing things that I think really came out of covid was the ability to watch other family members' kids play sports uh, online. I mean, I'm sure it was happening before that. But it connected to it Game It really Changer brought or that, like that in. Yeah, it was, it was some app. We, it was a Wilson Live on YouTube. We watched his games. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, I, the semifinal and championship, we watched start to finish the entire game. I watched all six innings last night. Elisha's team, Northwest Little League, beat Capital City 3-2. to two. Thrilling finish. They're up three to one going in the bottom of the sixth inning. They get bases loaded, no one out. And they end up getting out of it. And one plays a play at the plate where there's a close tag and he's out for the second out. There's sort of a, a leaping catch in right field for the final out of the game. It was awesome to watch. Congrats to Elisha Knight and his Northwest DC Little League teammates. They now move on to, it's actually the Little League World Series they're playing in, but not Williamsport. They're playing for the Mid-Atlantic region title, and there's four teams involved. D.C., my cousin's team, plays Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania State Champion, Sunday, August 7th at 9 a.m. Central Time, 10 a.m. Eastern. Then they get the winner of Delaware and Maryland. So then the winner of that Mid-Atlantic region will be where you see them on Big ESPN, ABC, in Williamsport at the Little League World Series. I'm pumped up to watch and have the game called by professionals uh, for my cousin Because you're Elijah. watching a wide-angle view that just shows you everything. I'm watching behind week. home plate. Yeah. You it's know, and pinned it's, it's up right, on the, on it's the right cage. there. Do they uh, have... It's, it's, it's a lot of fun to watch. And what's really cool about this team, I was texting with my cousin Nathan, his dad, this morning. You saw in the photo there. He said they have either practiced or played a game for six consecutive weeks straight. Not one day off, this team. And it's amazing to see how much they've improved. After they won the state title last night, their head coach said... All right, guys, great job. Celebrate. You get tomorrow off. And instead of applause, there was a sigh from the entire team. They wanted to get back out and practice. The next day, they wanted to be together and continue practicing, getting ready for what is now over a week away where they're going to play in Bristol, Connecticut, is where they move to now to play to go to Williamsport. Do they have any birth certificate bombers on this roster that are going to have no. to prove their age when so, they get there? Danny Some, a couple of their opponents, uh, Hutton, had a couple bombers up there that I'm thinking, this kid uh, looks like he may have his kids of his own <laughs> that's playing. He looks to be There's about 30 years old. One. There's always that one I'm telling you, sixth though, grader. El that... Elisha's team is, and Nathan, his dad, who was a great baseball player, says really just a good group of kids that's all steady. Like, there's no real superstars. They're all just good baseball players. 
They don't have anyone that's a gigantic out there. They all look like 11 and 12 year old kids. They're all good baseball players. It's a, it's a fun team to watch and follow. But it's, I've had a lot of fun. It's funny. With. I was at a tryout for Simon last night, which is so far away from what you're talking about. And I was sitting there listening to some dads who were just yapping the whole time. And I was thinking, I just love watching him play. Like, this is a somewhat intense thing. He's performing under pressure, fielding ground balls and, and getting six swings at a time, throwing 10 pitches at a time. There's nothing to it. And I'm loving this. Yeah. And it's, it's so far removed from what you're talking I love watching kids play baseball. I, I do, too. I, I really I, – I sent a text to the whole family. You know, the family text chain's going crazy with everyone watching. Three or four different That's states awesome. represented watching Elisha play. And I got so nervous in that last inning because this kid was dealing the whole game and started to struggle. I'm thinking if they lose, he had 17 pitches left that he could throw by Little League rules. They let going you finish the, the last the batter, I think. Well, he threw that, and they brought in a new guy who got out of the inning – after the starter finally struggled, not until the last inning. But when that ball's in the air and that right fielder is under, I'm thinking, if he doesn't catch this, the game, their season is over. And they lost in the championship. And he caught it, and Northwest Little League moves on. We're all fans. We'll be watching. Yes, we will. The very latest NFL headlines with Armando Salguero in 25 minutes. When we return, WWE United States champion Bobby Lashley joins OutKick 360.
Welcome back in Outkick 360 coming to you live from our sixth in Peabody Studios, downtown Nashville. Also coming to us live right now from downtown Nashville because he's getting set for SummerSlam in Music City this weekend is Bobby Lashley, WWE superstar. He is the U.S. champion. You can see it if you're watching right now by the belt over his shoulder, getting set for a match against Theory at SummerSlam this weekend. You can stream it at Peacock. Bobby, thanks so much for doing this, man, and welcome to Nashville. Thank you, thank you. It's my pleasure. So I want to start with this, man. Trust me, I mean this as a compliment. 46 years old uh, and staying in that level of shape. You you don't look 46 years old, That that's for sure. And we've seen guys age in the ring in their 40s, 50s, 60s, um, <laughs> you, you've stayed in tip-top shape. What is that regimen like for you to stay in that level of shape in your career? Well, I, I don't know what 46 is supposed to look like. <laughs> <laughs> if it's supposed to be old and withered, I'm not that. Uh, I think for me, it's just been consistency. I've, I've, I've done the same thing. I've, I've trained the same way. Um, I've taken care of myself. I'm not, I think more positive, I put more positive and than negative in. I'm not a big partier. I'm not a big drinker or anything like that. So um, I got goals and I, and I got kids. So uh, between my goals and my kids, my kids keep me young and my goals keep me uh, motivated. Is it easy for you to avoid that lifestyle? You know, partying, drinking, whatever it is, is I'm sure it's easier for some than others, but you know, living a WWE lifestyle where you're traveling a lot, I know you're very busy is it harder to avoid that or easier for you to avoid all of that? I think, it, I think it's easier. When, when I was going through, through high school, through college and everything like that, um, there was something that I always said. I always said that, you know, Gatorade tastes better at the top of the podium. Um, so, <laughs> so the same thing that I'm doing right now. I think a lot of people party all the way through it. Um, there's times when you party. There's times when I celebrated, when I won the world championship, when I won the United States championship, we celebrated, we partied, we had... We had a good time, but um, then then I always put that back, and I always said, "All right, it's, now it's time to go to work," um, because like I said, all this is going to be over pretty soon for me. Uh, not pretty soon; it's going to be over eventually. So right now, I'm just I'm I'm, I'm embracing everything. I'm I'm working as hard as I've ever worked before. Um, I, I'm I'm trying to be a part of everything. Like you said, today I'm in Nashville. Tomorrow I go um, to our I fly up to SmackDown to Atlanta. I do something at SmackDown, then I'm back to um, Nashville for SummerSlam, one of the biggest pay-per-views of the year. Um, I'm running it as a, as a champion, and, and everything that I'm doing is is just you have to stay prepared for it, you have to stay ready for it. And I have so many more goals that I want to accomplish before I retire from the sport of wrestling. So um, right now, it's it's no time to slack, it's no time to party, it's no time to um, pull back. It's we're moving in all the right directions right now. Well, and Nashville is excited for SummerSlam at Nissan Stadium uh, this weekend. It's an event that uh, this city has been anticipating for a long time. Unfortunately, there is some bad weather in the forecast for the weekend. Fingers crossed that there's a good chance it may dodge uh, us during oh. the time of SummerSlam also. Um, but I I'm curious, and this is just you know my small brain thinking here, and you may, may find this foolish, but... Is there a different preparation when you're getting ready for an outdoor event in wrestling from, from your perspective? Obviously, the optics of it, the sound of it is very different when you're in the middle of a gigantic football stadium for a pay-per-view event like this. But I'm just curious, with your mindset going into the ring, is there anything different in your preparation? I, you know what? No. No. There's not. I prepare for everything the same. I I I, I stay I stay regimented. I stay uh, locked in and and I stay ready. So for me, being SummerSlam, it is one of the bigger pay per views that we have. So I've kind of ramped up training a little bit more. But as far as indoor outdoor, it really doesn't make a difference to me. I think that you have to be ready for almost anything. And in our business, I don't know if my match is going to go five minutes. I don't know if my match is going to go thirty minutes. I don't know how how long it's going to go. So I have to just be prepared for almost anything. Um, we had to deal with this before. When we were in the pandemic, we were coming out of the pandemic, and our first pay-per-view back was WrestleMania, and it was in Tampa. Yep. And right before, we had one of the biggest rainstorms that you've seen in Tampa. And we were also ready. We were also, we, I mean, we were ready to go. And then, boom, the rain comes down. 
And I told him, I said, you know what? I'm at the point right now where I'm ready to fight. So I had a match against Drew McIntyre. And I said, if we have to fight back here, get the cameras rolling. Because we owe it to the fans and we owe it to ourselves to be out there and perform and do what we have to do. So it's nothing different here. I mean, whether the weather comes or not, we're going to be ready to go. And we're going to be ready to put on a show for the crowd. And Nashville has been kind of a special place for us because we've we've hit Nashville a couple times since the pandemic. And the crowd has been just amazing. And I think I said this before, is that, um, you know, there's this is our second, I believe, our second biggest pay-per-view of the year. There's only one pay-per-view bigger, and that's WrestleMania. So this is kind of a tester a little bit for the city of Nashville. You know, we come out, we show some support, we get amped up. We're going to have probably the greatest show that you've seen here. But then we also will start talking about maybe coming back and doing WrestleMania. So it's so important to be able to really show out and do what we're supposed to do and have the best show that we can out here in Nashville while we're here. It's one of those in Nashville. There's constant talk about Nissan Stadium. And now there's going to be a new stadium possibly being built there with capabilities to be indoor and what events could be there, you know, with, with indoor capabilities, Final Four, a Super Bowl. But SummerSlam, WrestleMania, when this stadium was built, were two of those events that a lot of people talked about. So it's really cool now to see SummerSlam coming to Nashville. Again, Saturday night, July 30th. You can stream it on Peacock. I know a lot of people are going to be in the building also. We're joined by Bobby Lashley, WWE superstar. I'm fascinated with your background, Bobby. Uh, obviously, hard work is not a problem for you go, going way back. Let's start with your wrestling background and the discipline required, even in high school wrestling, going on to wrestle in college, whether it be weight maintenance, uh, the practice time, e- everything involved and you put into it. How did that help shape you early on? Uh, I, well, I grew up in a military background, so my dad was a drill sergeant coming up. My dad was very simple with things. It's like he 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 instilled in us, you know, the harder you work, the luckier you get. And that's how it's always been for me. And when I see that, then I continue that. When I was going out in high school, you know, I wore I, there was that time where what do you do? What do you do? I didn't know what to do. I just started working harder, working harder, and then I won a state championship. Went on to college, kept that same mentality, started working even harder, and then I won nationals my sophomore, junior, senior year. And then it just kept going and kept going. So, I mean, it, to me, I learned the recipe for success. And the recipe for success for me has been just that hard work. So I'm no stranger to it, and I love doing it. And I, I always say you got to trust the journey. you got to love the journey. I think a lot of people get into the point where um, training hard becomes like a mental thing for them, where it's like I don't want to train harder because it, it's hard on my body. But for me, I always look at it as the harder I work, the luckier I get. So I enjoy the training. I enjoy working hard. I enjoy getting up early in the morning and doing cardio. It's just a staple in my life because I always look at it as, you know, the the small amount. Yes, it's hard during the time, but the small amount of energy and effort that you put into it, what you get out of it is astronomical. So, I mean, if I spend an extra hour or two hours a day and then I'm winning titles like this, I'm on top of the, I'm headlighting um, pay-per-views. I'm at the top of the business. I'm going into Hall of Fames. All these different things that are happening in my life is because of the hard work that I'm putting in. And I'm staying out of the, out of the places that I shouldn't be. So I think that you know, a lot of, as an athlete, as a performer, you say that, are we role models? Absolutely, I'm a role model. There's a lot of, a lot of kids watching what I'm doing. And the message that I'm giving to them is the same message that I got. That message was the harder I work, the luckier I'm getting. Like you said, I'm 46 years old, and I'm at the peak of my career. I'm in great shape um, mentally, physically, everything. Um, everything is just putting together. I mean, I'm, I feel great. You know, I do system checks all the time, and I'm like, is it time for retirement? I'm thinking about retirement, and no way. There's, I'm, I'm so far from it. If you watch me in the ring, I'm doing things that I was doing when I was 20-something years old, and everything feels good. So I'm going to ride this wave as long as I can. Because like I said, it all goes back to that hard work, that hard work, that luck. They, they go hand in hand. Well, and, and I know our time is a little bit limited with you today, Bobby. And this is something we'll continue to talk about with Jonathan and Paul because there are some very interesting stories as you came up in, in this business and other businesses that we're going to talk about. But before we let you go, I do want to ask you about Vince McMahon retiring, stepping down, 
Triple H now stepping into the creative role with WWE. Just in your opinion, how many possibilities are out there now with the future of WWE and the direction under Triple H and where this thing can head next? Uh, you know, first of all, I, I got to say with Vince, Vince is, and I told him this, I was like, Vince, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing how many, how many people that you have supported over your lifetime. Um, like you put my kids through school. He put a roof over my kid's head. And there's thousands of other people that can say that same thing. So I have the utmost respect for Vince uh, of what he's done and what he's created in, in this wrestling business. Without him, none of us. If Without him, we wouldn't be sitting here talking right now. So first of all, Vince has just been um, a blessing to so many different people. But at the same time, you know, Stephanie, Triple H, the mind that they have in this wrestling business is going to be shown within the next few years, few months, few weeks. And there's been a lot of times where I've gone to Triple H and I've asked him for different for advice on, on matches and uh, asked him for advice on on where I should go, what I should do. And he's always given me great advice. And I can say that moving forward, the wrestling business is in great hands because the great minds are always there. And, you know, Vince McMahon, I know he stepped away from the business, but he's always going to be somebody there to give some advice to help us out moving forward. Uh, for everyone, whether it's me going to him directly or him going to creative to kind of make things um, go in the direction that it should. But like I said before, Stephanie and and um, and Triple H, I think that the business is in great hands. Bobby Lashley, he is the United States champion. He's putting that belt up for grabs on Saturday against Theory at SummerSlam in Nashville. And as you just heard, he's nowhere near retirement either. Bobby, really appreciate your time, man. Best of luck moving forward and best of luck with this event. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. It's Bobby Lashley, WWE superstar. We'll take a quick break. We're going to be right back with more. This is Outkick 360 across the Outkick network.
Outkick 360 rolls on across the Outkick Network. Great chat there with Chad and Bobby Lashley from the WWE. Six the Peabody, our location with Yeehaw Beer and Old Smoky Moonshine. They nearly held the um, WWE tryouts this week here. Did I tell you guys that? At the venue? No. They, they opted to go somewhere indoors. That's why they ended up at the Wild Horse. But they looked, they came and toured this place. And that wanted, would have been awesome. They wanted to put the tryouts here. Then I really could have tried out. When Paul said, I'm already <laughs> trying out. Uh, maybe I could have done it. If, if it you could have dropped right that 15 studio. earlier. Yeah, I, I had to get to work quicker. Abs. I'm going to run around, <laughs> in a, uh, run around town in a trash bag like I'm trying to cut weight for an actual wrestling. <laughs> that would be so great if you had a trash bag on under your master's polo. Yeah, just, oh, and we just didn't say anything about the it. Entire show, just had it <laughs> spitting into a cup, like the old school, uh, like '90s baseball players. I feel like they always in batting practice had the thing that looked like a trash bag yeah. on underneath. Yeah, I just wear that underneath every polo shirt. You get the jump, you have the jump rope going during the commercial break to break a sweat. I'm just pouring sweat every segment. You guys look over here. <laughs> Is Chad okay? You sure you're gonna be all right? You don't seem healthy. It looked like uh, Lashley was just set up across the street from us, like at the Omni or something. You could have walked over there. Yeah, yeah I was talking to him uh, prior to him j uh, joining the show, and he said he's in Nashville. Already. I'm thinking you could have walked right over and, and joined us, and yeah, did, didn't didn't put that together. Didn't know he's going to be in town. Hit us up on Twitter at OutKick360. Armando is about to join us with NFL headlines. Um, Jensen, uh, the starting center for uh, the Buccaneers, Ryan Jensen, carted off the field. Uh, Clearly a knee injury, and we're waiting on official word to come out, but it does not look great. Uh, pro football doc, uh, Dr. David Chow, um, was on social media saying this is, uh, this is season ending. It's not going to be good. And it was, a, it was based on limited video, like it's a, a sideline cam he's watching to determine that. Hate for them to lose yes. a key guy that early, for anybody. Armando Salguero joins us on Outkick 360. Look at that background. Where's Foot my photo credit? Football is uh, <laughs> is here with all the practices, Armando. It's great to have you back on. Uh, it's my pleasure. Yes, Paul Kuharski photo credit for this right here. Great job by Kuharski. You're you've got a career as a photographer. If ever radio doesn't go exactly right for you, Kuharski, you, you should be wearing a Marlins hat. He's no, also wearing a Yankees hat. Well, I feel like he's really uh, catering to yeah, you today, Paul, sucking, with sucking the up. Titans like photo it. and then the Yankees hat. This is great. Terrific. Yeah, the, the alternate Yankees hat. This isn't traditional, guys. I hope you know. <laughs> the day they wear that. I'm against them any, wearing anything except the navy blue hat. I don't want them in the camo hat, the pink hat, anything. I support all the causes, but I'm a believer that they should only wear the uniform, period. I don't know, man. When they wear the NY with the American flag, that looks pretty cool. So, um... I think that Kyler Murray's going to be wearing the same uniform now. We know for, for a little while longer, but in doing so, Armando, to have that privilege, he's going to have contractually mandated four hours of independent study time every week. What, what did you make when you first saw that report? Uh, what, what was your initial reaction? And the, the longer you process the story, what are your thoughts? Yeah, that was an amazing transition there, Chad. Thank you very I, I'm much. I always very, search very for the well perfect... Done. You Somebody got, had to get you us got, out. You got to search the perfect transition. I think I finally found it. You, 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 you're an amazing professional. <laughs> I got to tell you that. So, yeah. So Kyler Murray was not scheduled to speak with the media, but he decided that he'd had enough. And so he asked to speak with the media about the so-called homework clause in his contract. And for those that are not familiar the clause in his two hundred and thirty million uh, and a half dollar contract says that Kyler Murray must study film away from you know uh, coaching and 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 the quarterback room a minimum of four hours per week, and obviously. You know, this begs questions, well, if the Arizona Cardinals are putting that into a contract, they obviously have concerns that Kyler Murray hasn't been preparing enough, hasn't been watching enough film, or at least someone in the organization is concerned enough for that. And obviously also, Kyler Murray and his agent agreed to it, man. 
So when he comes out today and he says it's disrespectful that anyone would say that I don't study enough, okay. He says it's almost a joke that anyone would suggest I don't study enough. What he really should have done is told the team that gave him that clause and he signed, hey, this is disrespectful and almost a joke. He didn't do that. And so Kyler Murray is complaining to the wrong people. It's not the media that wrote the contract. It's the team he plays for. It's not the media or the pundit, uh, you know, the pundits that signed the contract. It's him. Uh, I, the, the whole thing, every, every time someone has opened their mouth relative to this situation, they look worse because Kyler Murray looks bad. The Arizona Cardinals look bad, too, because they're the ones that gave a quarterback $230.5 million when they're obviously not sure that he studies enough. Yeah, and I think it was Ian Rappaport who had the initial detail in the contract that posted it. So this all started with that detail being published for everyone to see. What do you make, Armando, of the silence coming from Arizona where they could easily leak a story to someone or get their side of this out there if they wanted to protect Kyler Murray in any way in his reputation. There's a number of ways they could spin this as to why they put that in the contract. What do you make of their silence, if anything? Well, <laughs> their silence has been when you know the coaching staff says things like, we don't have anything to do with contracts. We just coach. <laughs> that You know what that is? That's people running for the door <laughs> because they're being asked about something that is clearly uncomfortable to them. Um, I believe personally that this clause was a ownership-driven clause. I also believe that it's it's a sign that someone wasn't really thinking. It, it clearly is a sign someone wasn't really thinking because, like I said, it makes everyone look bad. Oh, by the way, the only way that it's not going to look bad is if Kyler Murray in the next three years or so, while he's still under all those guarantees, he actually takes that team, um, you know, to, to heights that it has not yet attained or achieved under him. Julio Jones, a big, pricey disappointment here last year. Titans didn't have a second rounder or third rounder because of him. Um, and I don't think it was just that he was hurt, Armando. I think he needed to feel just right in order to, to get out there. They did not get what they uh, paid for. They got crushed for it. Now everybody nationally is saying, oh, what a great move by the Bucks." Um, obviously they, they're not going to count on him for the same kind of snaps and participation Tennessee did. Ne nevertheless, what, what do you think about the Bucks counting on him for anything? Well, he's early season insurance for Chris Godwin, right? Uh, Chris Godwin uh, had a ACL injury at the end of last year. He's not practicing yet. He's expected to be fine, but not yet. And so it doesn't hurt to have a future, you know, pro football hall of famer on the roster, just in case um, I'm with you, you know, he's 33 years old and the last two seasons that he's played have been injury plagued. And so that suggests he's on the downside, but in Tampa Bay, the downside is catching passes from Tom Brady. In Tennessee, the downside was catching passes from Ryan Tannehill. I'm wondering if one might be a better situation for Julio Jones than the other. Armando, your thoughts on, uh, let's tie this in. Um, uh, Mike Vrabel saying he doesn't want to be a coach known for the talent on the field. Yeah, um, Unless the talent is a professional wrestling legend, right? Yeah, that's right. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Come 
Come on, Paul, give me a woo. I am not a wrestling guy, Armando. Paul's not. Paul's I'm not. not I'm not gonna woo. Not big, big shocker, I know, but Paul's not yeah, a big I woo like guy. I like real, real stuff. I passed the cartoon phase at about 14. Woo. Okay. Uh, you were there when he was talking. I to was. The, you know, he was talking to the media. I know people uh, on my Twitter feed like it. That doesn't mean I like. it. I got you. I, I got love you. it, we Armando. Talking- you're speaking. You're preaching to the <laughs> choir right here. Sign me up for a Ric Flair interview immediately. Woo! Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, do you prefer a Ric Flair interview where he tells you uh, how great he is, how great the '70s, '80s, and '90s were, how beautiful women flock to him, or do you want a player telling you he's working hard and <laughs> you know? He's he's doing his best to get past today because it's one day at a time. Option three, please. I would I would rather interview Ric Flair than anyone in the NFL currently outside <laughs> of Aaron Rodgers or Tom Brady. I think I'd put Absolutely. Ric Flair third on the list of current NFL people, coach, or play. I'd put McDaniel on that list, too. I feel like he'd be interesting. But Ric Flair is probably third on the list of who I want to talk to. Totally fair. And... Getting back to your original question, when Mike Vrabel says that he doesn't worry about talent, it's not about talent for him, that's brilliant. That really is brilliant. I love that because I've had coaches who privately tell me they've got five pro bowlers over there. How are we going to beat that? And, And they obviously go out and try to, but they're, they're, Original default position is we're undermanned. They're going to be better. How do we compete? Mike Mike Vrabel is like, well, they might be more talented, but we might be more disciplined and we might make fewer mistakes and we might be tougher and we might be in better condition. And so we might win. And that's great because that's how the Tennessee Titans do win and will have to continue to win. That was in response to my question about had they, you know, gotten better around Tannehill, which was one of their themes. And um, I I think we could all agree, as of now, minus A.J. Brown, they don't have anybody that could do what A.J. Brown did. And you can only, you know, I I, I like his overall theme, but at some point when you lose a guy that can run away from people and give you that, that big play threat that Hutton has all the numbers... Uh, they don't have that big play threat anymore. And when you don't have that, that when you, you're minus that until Traylon Burks shows you that he can be that, y- y- they average, you are going to lose some games because you don't have They that. averaged three yards less per play without A.J. Brown in the lineup last year. That's massive. Fair. And obviously, we're a year beyond the – they don't have John O. Smith anymore. And – Oh, by the way, they were the number one seed in the AFC last year. But the AFC has added some talent at quarterback. Yeah, uh, everywhere. And so, and and the AFC has added some talent at pass rusher, where a couple of teams like, say, the Los Angeles Chargers now have two in Khalil Mack and Bosa. The Raiders did the same thing. Multiple teams have upgraded. The Broncos went out and got Russell Wilson, and they've got a pretty stout defense to begin with. How does that talent get overcome by the coach that, you know, isn't worried about talent? Hey, while we're on the Titans, quickly I wanted to take your temperature on Bud Adams. He he didn't make the final 12 out of the coach contributor category. I'm one of the new members of that committee, which grew from nine to 12. I, I don't think he's the guy that's going to get this, the one spot, but that he didn't make the 12 really surprises me. He can never get any traction. I know he was eccentric and weird late, but co-founding the AFL, pushing the money on the AFL and, and really being a, a formative guy with the merger that created the league as we know it to me deserves more than he gets Meanwhile, Art Modell, the most uh, vilified owner maybe in history, who did a lot of big things with the TV deals, gets one of those 12 spots. I I was just baffled by it. Where do you come down on Bud Adams? 
Yeah, those. That's a great just juxtaposition of Model and Adams because I think one of the problems with both of them is they both moved franchises and did so in ugly fashion. And so uh, I, I just look. Bud Adams left Houston, man. <laughs> he left the Astrodome. That's rough. Okay, and I know that the people of Nashville love it and love him for it, but from a greater perspective of the NFL, Houston is a is a huge market. It's a great football town in a great football state. You leave Houston, that's not a check by your name. That's, you know, that that's negative. That's not a good thing. Armando Salguero, our guest on Outkick 360. Uh, early returns, it's not hard to search in the morning here. I know we're Central Time, but East Coast. By the time the Titans are starting practice, we're getting interception reports from Baker Mayfield in Carolina, for instance. Uh, I don't see as many play-by-play -play highlights of Trey Lance in San Francisco yet. What, what are early returns early in the second year, but really the first season, the inaugural season, as Trey Lance is the guy with the 49ers? What have you heard and, and read through the, through the grapevine over the last 48 to 72 hours? Right, so context, uh, Jonathan, is we're still like basically only in the second day of practices. These are not padded practices yet. No one is in pads in the NFL yet, as far as I know. Uh, Jacksonville will be the first team that will be able to do that, but they're not yet. And so it's not really football yet. Yep. It's seven on seven, and a lot of teams are starting out with red zone. So the interceptions that you're seeing or hearing about, it's because they're playing on a 20-yard field a lot of the times. Uh, I, don't, I don't take a lot of meaning out of that. Um, as far as Trey Lance is concerned, Trey Lance is going to have growing pains, gentlemen. And I think the San Francisco 49ers know that. The locker room in San Francisco knows that based on what I've heard. And they're fine with it. Because along with that growing pain is a higher ceiling than what they have or had with Jimmy Garoppolo. And there's more of a of a tension that he can also do more athletic things like, oh my God, he can run. And so they are willing to take the short-term pain for the what they think is going to be long-term gain. What has been Roethlisberger gaining by speaking so much regarding his departure in Pittsburgh now? You know, it's it's funny because my experience, and maybe you guys have had the same experience, maybe I'm unique, but when guys are on teams and in locker rooms, a lot of them are less likely to speak their mind and to seek out uh, media attention because it comes organically, right? And they have their names in you know, in public and it's out there and what they think matters a lot of the time, especially if you're, for example, the quarterback of the Pittsburgh Steelers, a legacy team in the NFL. Ben Roethlisberger has had that after what he started in 2004. So after what, 16 years or whatever, he's had that pulled out from under him. And now all of a sudden he has opinions and now all of a sudden he wants to tell people stuff. Uh, you know, I think that's a, that's a commentary on Ben's self-awareness and sensitivities and ego more than anything. Armando, we had this discussion the other day on the show, and I want you to chime in on this. It's obviously the NFL. There's, you can find something interesting on every team across the league. But we discussed one team that each of us just can't find much interest in going into this season. Just completely uninteresting teams. I threw out the New York Giants as, as my example, even with a new coach, because their quarterback situation 
I don't find them to be that interesting or compelling. What's the top team that comes to mind for you? If you had to pick one of the 32 that you would say, I'm not really that into this team. Seattle. Um, and the reason I say that, number one, they're way over there. Yeah. Like, way <laughs> over there. And I'm it's way a good over trip. here. Like physically from Miami to Seattle, you're really not the into them. Trip you're, in the you're not interested in that, that we trip. We could not get further away it's from true. each other. Uh, but beyond that, Geno Smith doesn't move the needle for me. Or anyone. Drew Locke doesn't move the needle for me. When the most interesting thing about your team is the fact that your best wide receiver, DK Metcalf, is holding in and you have the oldest coach in the league, you've got problems. You've got issues. Something's wrong because no one's talking about you. And oh, by the way, the, the defending Super Bowl champions play in your division. You've got problems. How about the report from NBC on um, the, the trade that didn't happen back in 2018? NBC reported that in 2018, the Seahawks offered Cleveland Russell Wilson and their first-round pick, I believe, was the trade, right? Or for a first-round pick. And they wanted to go draft Josh Allen Ooh. and trade Russell Wilson to Cleveland. Why didn't Cleveland do that? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that, 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 because Cle they're Cleveland. Yeah. Later they coveted. They're I guess Cleveland. that's be before they had the sensible people who wanted Russell Wilson later. Well, but see, they didn't trade it because they had the number one pick, and that was the year they drafted Baker Mayfield. Yeah, Russell Wilson over over a, un, a, a collegiate Baker Mayfield is a no brainer, I think. That's fair. You also, you also uh, have to have Russell Wilson who wants to play for you in some capacity, right? Like you, I'm pretty you want sure the veteran he there. didn't want to. Yeah, yeah I'm Clearly pretty sure not. that, you know, Cleveland today is different than Cleveland 2018. Let's, let's, yeah, let's just establish that, right? I mean, they've actually been to the playoffs the last once, the past couple of years. They've got a nice roster now. Um, they have a coaching staff that is – proficient um and that wasn't none of those were the case in 2018 uh none of them and so i don't blame russell wilson for wanting to you know put a, a, a basically a, a dent in his career um if indeed that's accurate if josh but, allen was in seattle you'd be interested despite the fact that they were over there Assuming they will have developed him in the same the way, same way yeah. that the Buffalo Bills did. But I mean, wow. Josh Allen. Let's 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 not rewrite history. Yeah, Josh it. Allen didn't come into the NFL as a ready-made product. Fair. He was bad early on. Really, it, 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 putting Russell Wilson in Cleveland in 2018 would have been interesting. 2019, they were paving Cleveland streets in gold prior to week one's kickoff against the Titans the night before when we flew in. That's right. And they were throwing a parade for a Super Bowl run before September 10th even rolled around in 2019 with Baker going into year number two. And that would have been, hypothetically, Russell Wilson's team at it that point. It would have point. been That's a, really crazy. By the way, they, they had 18 penalties in that game. <laughs> That's a tough number to They got to reach. up to a bad start, but they had a lot of reason to be feel good about themselves. Yes. They did. It, 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 all, until the game started. Yes, until, I understand. Yes, until the game started. There's always a uh, look back over the shoulder, you know, has-beens and woulda, coulda, shoulda, but that one's interesting given the developments that Seattle just traded Russell Wilson to Denver. And I noticed on OutKick, Armando, you mentioned over 2,000 fans showed up for the first practice for the Broncos this this uh, for the first practice this past week, and the first fan showed up 24 hours earlier to get in line for that practice, which, which is stunning. And compare that to say, for example, the Washington Commanders, where if you go on social media and you look at the photos of their crowd today, there was um, there was the 78 year old retired guy wearing an umbrella hat. You know, one of those hats that have a little umbrella at the top. Yes. And then the cricket over there and the, <laughs> the feral cat over there. And, <laughs> you know, nothing else. 
Um, it's clearly a contrast in exposure, in expectation. Uh, I'm bullish on the Broncos. I, I mean, my only worry is that the, the defense, which was very good under Vic Fangio the last couple of years because he is just an outstanding defensive coach, will take a step back. On the other hand, uh, I expect that offense to, to take a leap forward. Um, Lamar Jackson asked today if he's comfortable going into the season while negotiating a contract. Keep in mind, he, he's negotiating his contract. He says, no, there, there's going to be a cutoff at some point. And then Lamar said, quote, I think so, when he was asked if he thinks something eventually gets done. So there's your daily update in Baltimore for the contract situation. But at least he's out there. There are others having the sit-ins. There are no more no more holdouts in the NFL. Hold-ins. Uh, hold-ins, yes. That's, that's what you that. call yes. it. That's great. There, there are no more, um, no more holdouts due to the $50,000 mandatory daily fine. Right. Um, and it would be crazy if Lamar Jackson, who basically stiff-armed the Ravens <laughs> when they wanted to conduct contract talks with him in the offseason – would come to camp and hold in because of his contract. That's, that, that would just be crazy, and it would send a bad message, and it would be a lack of leadership. And if anything, Lamar Jackson is a leader and understands he's the quarterback, the face of the franchise, and is not about to send bad, bad messages. Also, if a contract doesn't get done, he's going to make $24 million this year. And – the, the thing about it is the both parties are interested in getting something done. It's Lamar Jackson is going to play for the Baltimore Ravens. Okay. He's not going anywhere. Even if he doesn't sign a contract, they'll franchise him after the year and Lamar Jackson will be a Baltimore Raven. So what we're talking about now is basically where does that land? Let's see. Deshaun Watson signed a $230 million contract. Kyler Murray signed one for $230.5 million. Will Lamar Jackson get more than $230.5 million and close to $50 million a year? I think that might happen. 231 on the dot. Armando, we're up against it, so I'll leave you with this. Uh, by Tomorrow morning, do we have news leaked out from the Daniel Snyder closed-door deposition happening in D.C.? He showed up today under the uh, agreement that he would uh, uh, agree to qu answer questions as long as it was closed-door and not for the public knowledge. Will news leak, and will we be discussing that as, the, uh, as we open the show? Uh, well, I, I think that there will be a leak because people who want to make Daniel Snyder look bad are interested. And so, and, and they're politicians. So I, I mean, is there anyone that leaks more than politicians? <laughs> but will you open your show with this tomorrow? You better get a better rundown sheet than, hey, that's than what Daniel I, Snyder. Again, that's testimony. what, uh, if it's big enough, it leads the show. If it doesn't, it hits the back burner. But we're talking Daniel Snyder and the Washington craziness. Uh, thank you as always, Armando, and uh, we'll, we'll keep up with every news and note throughout camp at OutKick. Armando, we've got to hey. keep those two fans at the commander's practice updated. <laughs> well, maybe at some point Ric Flair shows up and, and brings a crowd with him, except for you, Paul, That's, not you. It's entertaining, I, I acknowledge. Thank you, Armando. Thank you. More coming on OutKick 360.
Glad you're with us across the Outkick Network. Crew's all here today. Sixth and Peabody, our location with Yeehaw Beer and Old Smoky Moonshine. Paul, the Yankees made a big trade yesterday. Ben Attendi in from Kansas City. Guy is everything that Joey Gallo is not. He makes contact. He's a bat-to-ball lefty. Unfortunately, instead of cutting Joey Gallo, which is what they need to do, designate him for assignment, uh, they just send down somebody else. So they insist on keeping Gallo on the roster. That's fine if you just want to put him on the bench and never play him. They'll put him up once in a while hoping he hits a home run, which is the only thing he can ever do. But he strikes out 15 times for any time he does anything. Here is the stat. Uh, Aaron Judge has 37 home runs this year, I believe. Maybe 38. 38 home runs, let's say. Joey Gallo has 37 hits. Wow. What, That's why they need Ben Attendi. What was the level of prospect the three minor leaguers they gave up? How good, good, how good, good not incredible. So if they I, want to stack prospects to go get Castillo, who they need from the Reds, um, they still can. And they need a middle reliever because they lost Michael King, who fractured his elbow. Yeah, I saw some, they need more moves. some story asking the question, uh, did the Royals get enough in return? with the three players they sent back that they probably could have done better that may be fair. with another team look, that, with a, a different farm system. The Yanks system. are 10 and 12 in their last 22. So does that concern me? Yeah. Are they still 33 games over 500? And do you have every cause to believe they'll be fine? Yeah. What just concern you is what they're doing against the Mets and the Astros. Yeah. Well, the Mets, they're, I don't, I, they're not going to see unless the Mets make the World Series. Astros, right. I told you a long time ago, worry the hell out of them. Mets are very good. Only thing that eases my we pain can, we right now. We can officially now say that right now with that you, staff. If you go look at a Red Sox reel right now, they're playing some of the worst defense in the history of baseball. They drop pop ups, they throw ground balls away, pass first. So I take a little joy in that while I'm a little worried about the Yankees right now. But Chad, they've uh, got plenty of time. Is Jorge Soler about to be a brave again? Uh, I don't know, but that uh, ball he hit in the World Series against the Astros for a home run in game one, I don't think it's landed. Because Duvall's not coming. One of my back. favorite moments was that Duvall's home run. Duvall's out, right? Yeah. They, they, they're going they to do to move, something. Right? They're, they're going to make I a move. This go is going to be a good trade, then. Yeah. They, they, they need an outfielder now that Duvall is out. They, they need someone there. And let's get Otani moved. To let's, the Braves. Let's get it happen. Come Anywhere. On. Bring in the Braves. Let's, <laughs> let's give Otani some relevance, finally. How about that? Get him away from the Angels. Headlines next, including the Colts, and we compare rookie quarterbacks coming up.
third hour of Outkick 360 is here from 6th and Peabody. With Yeehaw Beer and Old Smoky Moonshine, Nashville, Tennessee, our base. And across the Outkick Network, we say hello. Plenty of headlines to hit today. We will jump into some NFL discussion. And then coming up in about 25 minutes, I'll pose the question, should the ACC membership, should the universities and leadership at the individual programs be worried about the conference leadership? And I will base it off of a quote in comparing leadership at the SEC and the Big Ten. This is what we do on this show. We take one quote and we turn it into a big discussion. Well, I, I taking, feel like, I, and I don't think I'm speaking out of turn here. No. I think we do this as well as anyone I, out there. Let's examine four lines of words and then take that into a broader discussion about the state it. of something. What I, I, I love this type of thing. What I am bringing to the table are two answers to the same question about where we're headed in college football. And Jim Phillips it. is completely on the opposite end of this question than what we heard over the last two weeks from Kevin Warren and Greg Sanger. Cannot wait to discuss. Um, let's uh, quickly, so yesterday it took one practice for the quarterback's coach in Atlanta during a session with the media to say that Marcus Mariota is the starter. Arthur ahead. Smith had kind of said it already. But, but definitively, like they're not, they're not like trying to pretend that there's any type of push uh, for Mariota there from Desmond Ritter. But I, I ask this, I bring it up because we have Atlanta who is telling us Mariota is starting. I think, I think we're going to see Rudolph, or not, excuse me, we're going to see um, Trubisky. Trubisky start in Pittsburgh. Yep. But they ha they're not saying that. Tomlin continues to say and laugh and smile and say, hey, ask me tomorrow because I don't have an answer right now. When asked when they plan on naming a starter. And that'll so be every a day, stick all camp. Yeah, every day they're going to ask that. And then Trubisky likely, likely plays week one, and eventually we see Kenny Pickett play. But just comparing the two, those are the two places where we could see the rookie insert first, right? Um, Both third-rounders? It's not Carolina. What? Both third-rounders? No, Pickett was the only first-round quarterback. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, Ritter... Went Ritter ahead was. of uh, Malik Willis. And so and uh, in, in thinking of those two, even though Atlanta has named Mario to the starter, would you guys, like if you just had all things being equal and you said, okay, it's even money, who would you put your money on to play first? When I say play, start. Injuries aside here, you know how I don't like dealing with the injury factor because yep. it could happen with any position at any point. Uh, but for today's... Roster and what we know, which coach is likely to turn to the rookie first, Tomlin or Arthur Smith? Arthur Smith. Which, so the, the, my answer is, it's, it's a great question because I think my answer is different based on the perspective I, I look through. If, I, if you're asking me which coach would be quicker to go with the future and something new, Mike Tomlin or Arthur Smith, I think Arthur Smith being the offensive guy, if they saw something in Ritter, they draft him 74th overall, third round, I think he'd be quicker to go the direction of the future, also being a second-year head coach. Mike Tomlin, who's had the same starting quarterback his entire yep. career, would be more inclined to stick with a guy who's got starting experience and stay with him longer as opposed to going to the rookie and Kenny Pickett, even though Kenny Pickett was drafted well before Desmond Ritter. Arthur Smith, as long as they feel like they could keep Ritter upright. Uh, and yeah. this isn't talking about Mariota's health concerns. It's talking about uh, not crushing the kid's confidence. Because Atlanta is a nothing team right now. They're waiting for the bucket loads of money to become available to them next year. And they never wanted Mariota. They don't want Mariota. They, they got him because he was the, the only thing available and it was better than nothing. They have a previous relationship and he knew he could make it function to, to some degree. Pittsburgh wanted Trubisky. 
I mean, they hadn't decided what they were doing well, draft wise, and they got him on the very they first wanted day. Trubisky, I think. Yeah, you're right. And but they also wanted that uh, they, they wanted Pickett. They drafted him in the first round in uh, Colbert's final draft, and Omar Khan's taking over, and he had been in the front office in all those meetings. Tomlin certainly was too. So. They're also validating where they selected him. Meanwhile, sure, but I think Atlanta passed on the option to take Pickett. They didn't go young quarterback this year, and they waited all the way until the third round to get so Desmond Ritter. They weren't going to force anything. And I think it's fine that Pittsburgh liked Pickett, ultimately took Pickett, but I think they decided early, we're going to get ourselves a veteran that yeah. can cover us for a while. And when, if and when we draft a rookie, we can go slow. See, and I, in Atlanta, they said, we have to stick our finger in the hole in the dam, uh, and we're going to do it with Marcus Mariota. Do we like Desmond Ritter, ultimately? Yes, in this position, right. which is not a position that dictates that we play him quickly. And basically, like, hey, last year we won more games than people expected with a kind of taped-together roster. We're going to try to do it again. We're not sacrificing anything. We're not going for a top pick in the draft. We'll land where we land, trying to slap it together. But ultimately, uh, it's either going to be Ritter or it's going to be somebody else. And we'll see about that in 2023. The, the Ritter, so, like, so the, the other factor that Ritter isn't, isn't going to hear or face the same way we're going to see this in Pittsburgh is the demand to play the backup. The, uh, we mentioned it yesterday. It took two incomplete passes. And then you're hearing the chants from fans that media media are pointing out. Atlanta's got zero expectations. Right? In Pittsburgh, well, you're always expecting to yeah, compete. Yeah, but you've got... Uh, it's a little different, though, because you have the college guy from your city... Who you're familiar with. Who your was fans there forever. Know him. Your fans know him. Yeah, and it has now been the first-round pick of the franchise to replace Roethlisberger, and you want to just go ahead and get him in and play him because he's a first-round pick. So... The demand for him is going to be loud because Trubisky comes in without huge expectations, but he's the best option in free agency at the time, not going the trade route this offseason. I'm, I'm interested in the two because it's not going to happen here, barring injury with Malik Willis, and it's not going to happen with Matt Corral no. in Carolina. So if, you're, if we start to really gauge where it turns this year and where the quarterback class is, is starting to be judged, it's on those two, and it starts with Pickett. But I think there's a chance we see Ritter first, um, just out of sheer necessity. Well, and then you set aside the injury thing. I mean, the reason it's going to happen, I think, is because of the injury uh, thing. I mean, Marcus so. Mariota might not make it out of camp, depending Who's, on how much he plays in the preseason. I've got no faith in Marcus Mariota staying healthy. They put him in for a handful of plays last year in, for the Raiders, and he got hurt. Yep. A handful of plays as a gimmick. Separate of that first question, if both are healthy, who's the better NFL quarterback right now, Trubisky or Mariota? I mean, I think it's neck and neck, honestly, Chad. It's a tough one, right? I mean, <laughs> that's part of that. You got to factor that in. Who's Chad? Who's I can't got, get words. Who's the better to, quarterback that could actually keep the job longer? I can't get words to come out of my mouth to this question, and that's very rare. It's, it's a I'll, close I'll, comparison. I'll, I'll answer it. I think Mariota's better. Well, I he certainly he certainly suck. has had more success um, given certain circumstances. It was so but, long ago. Well, it wasn't that long ago. But, I mean, that's so long ago Didn't in his career. Didn't he have, like, one great game with the Raiders? Well, second he had year in? he was really good. Yeah, he had that one great game yeah. two years ago. But he's so far removed from his sustained success, which was his second that's year. Better than, yeah. That's better than never having sustained no, success. I, I agree. I think, I think he's probably better, but it's hard for me to say. Well, it's difficult because, I, again, I'm asking the question, not who's had the better career. That would be Mariota overall. But who's better right now? Here's my question, too. And I, I don't know the answer. I'm curious. I hope I read it somewhere. Has he changed? Because going into his last year, and you guys know this, I was obsessed with this. Going into his last year with the Titans, when we knew he had to perform big to get them to give him another contract. Yep. And I asked him this repeatedly. You know, what are you changing about your approach? What, what are you changing going forward? How are you adjusting what you're doing to, to get different results? And he said... Repeatedly. I'm not. I'm doing what I've done the whole time. And I was like, how is this possible when your results have gotten so much worse that you are going to just stay the course? It was ridiculous to me that he wasn't changing anything. The one big change Marcus Mariota made when he's in Tennessee is Hutton what? 
He started coming out for warm-ups before the official warm-ups of the game. <laughs> That's the one thing yeah. he did in his time here that he changed. The, if he hasn't changed at all like that, give me Trubisky. The, the other thing to factor in of the two starters now is Mariota's familiarity with Arthur Smith. And Dave Ragone is the listed offensive coordinator. Yeah, who in, was his quarterback Atlanta. coach for a time, right? Yeah, briefly. So early, uh, he's he's paired there with uh, Drake London, who's the the, the rookie wide receiver. Um, they they of course have Kyle Pitts, the rookie tight end, who is treated like a wide receiver. Big targets. Uh, Brian Edwards, who's a possession guy coming from Vegas, who may have played or practiced with Mariota uh, there. Um, I'm trying to keep the, the the time frame there. They have Cordero Patterson as a running back, though. Yeah, and and that's. That's where it really becomes iffy for me is with Mariota, you've got to have a reliable, the run game. steady running. Yeah, you, you're yeah everything's got to be in place. Yeah, to run that stuff. And, and with, with Trubisky, he does have Najee Harris. So yeah, Look, in Pittsburgh, they're going to play defense and run. Trubisky's going to be supplemental and sometimes maybe ornamental if they can really – in a winter game, right? Well, that, Mariota, so, you're right, does not have that luxury. These are all to, to truly – Bury it down and answer that question. The, the, the secondary questions are all interesting. Yeah. Who's the better quarterback right now? Trubisky right now or Ben Roethlisberger last year for Pittsburgh? Roethlisberger. Based on what I watched. Um, it could be Trubisky. Throw. Yeah, Roethlisberger is really bad. He couldn't was terrible. Throw. He couldn't move and he couldn't throw. That's a bad combination. That's So, I mean, it it, really as bad. shocking as it sounds... Could be Trubisky. The Steelers just went from a Hall of Fame quarterback to Mitch Trubisky, and they got better at quarterback. And they were already from a one playoff year to the next. team last year. One year to the next, they, they yeah. may have improved. And, and they were seven I, of seven, and I we talked not, repeatedly about how the seventh team no in both one, conferences was going to be really bad, and they fulfilled that. Looking at mm. both teams, not a, not a soul is going to say that the Falcons got better at quarterback from Matt Ryan to no. Mariota. Right. No. You could make the argument, just because the, as bad as You're Roethlisberger right. was in the end, the Steelers are better at quarterback with Trubisky. Even with a bad replacement. Frank Reich, you mentioned Indy and, and Matt Ryan. Frank Reich is gushing over Matt Ryan. The whole city is gushing over it. I wonder if Dockett will catch They were asked about how if, if, if things felt different from a year ago at this time. And Reich oh, said, quote, wait. it's night and day. <laughs> like, I, I can't let this go. Because they're going to throw Reich him under the bus every chance they get. Carson Wentz to be there. And now he's the He the facilitated reason for, the trade. And now he's the reason for everything having been bad. It, you're right. He, he's connected to Wentz. So every time he berates Wentz, you're right. He's berating himself. But he's, like, he's paraded as like this offensive mind genius. Guru. And if Matt Ryan's going to make him look good because it, it's Matt Ryan. But whenever you attach yourself to Carson Wentz through that trade that they made... And give up what they did. Now they they it, they lightened the the blow. Thanks to the commanders. Yes, thanks to the Washington Commanders. Who are but, dumber than they are. Yes. But they were dumb too. And here's right. The team just gravitates towards him. You feel it from the team, you sense it from the team, and that's what we have right now with Matt. Look, that make him sound like Jesus. Matt Ryan's <laughs> a, su a sufficient upgrade from what they got, don't get me wrong. But he's also old Matt Ryan. He's a mobile Matt Ryan. Uh, he's gonna have to throw the ball away a, a lot. They're better with Matt Ryan, but he's not. Gene, he's not Aaron Rodgers. He's not Mahomes. He's not Brady. He may, so it, they're fooling themselves but, into thinking they've well, got that. But it, the thing is, he doesn't have that's to be how bad that. It was. He doesn't have to be that because they have Jonathan Taylor. And if the head coach will turn this into a run-first mentality offense, they will be considerably better. And, and if they and play he defense, also, he they got to rush the passer, and, and Stephon Gilmore's got to be good. He may be Jesus from a leadership perspective. Doesn't mean he's a great quarterback right now. I mean, I buy what they're saying there. I'm, he's a pro. I'm yeah. sure he's coming there and he's made friends and he's done things the right way and he's, you know, talked to everyone in the building and he exudes an aura of leadership, professionalism, and everyone loves him and is drawn to him. Doesn't mean he's not going to go out there and look like an old man at times. But, Chad, they ma they're making it sound like they've been 40 years in the desert. Yes. Two years ago, they had Jesus Phillip wasn't allowed to grow old. Two, <laughs> two years ago. <laughs> we're seeing Matt Ryan grow old before our eyes. Two years ago, we're they had. We keep having biblical references to Matt Ryan. Two years ago, they had Philip Rivers, who also was a consummate pro and guy and gave them and all won. of these qualities, and they won. But 
they're making it sound like, my God, Matt Ryan, we haven't seen a guy like that, this around here since yeah. a- Andrew Luck, who also wasn't that long ago, by the way. But, yeah, my God, it's been so barren for so long. It's not. I mean, Carson Wentz must have really, really, really had people uh, hating him in that building because they're making it sound like it's been a lot more than 17 games since they had a leader in the quarterback position, and Phillip Rivers was only 17 games ago. It was pretty bad. I mean, knowing that Wentz, watching that one hard knocks where they go to Jacksonville and lose, and watching Wentz as soon as the game's over, they, they're not even off the field yet, and he is going up to a teammate laughing and cutting up oh. with a smile on his face, and he's oh, mic'd up so we know he's talking. It's odd. Well, it's the, the next day when they're Reich's, cleaning out the locker and he's going and, like, thanking some of the guys in the offensive Frank, line. And he's just being Frank goofy. Frank I, I put in the same boat. He wasn't yeah. laughing and cutting up, but the speech he gave in the locker room after the loss with ownership there, with Ursay there. Is it about the mountain? Yeah, no, he said sometimes things just don't fall in your favor, and we're, we're that team this year. But it says nothing about you. We're all winners in this room. Yeah, no, it's just, no, uh, it, it just it, doesn't it, fall in your favor. So – has nothing to do with us. Our, our buddy Warren Sharp. <laughs> Except out of everything. Our, yes. Our buddy Warren Sharp uh, sent this stat out about Indianapolis. Um, he, he tweeted out, look, he said, look, it's a huge upgrade for Indianapolis at quarterback. But ha- they have a sneaky start to the season. And then he references not just their schedule this year, but what they've done recently out of the gate. So week one, they are at Houston. Indianapolis is 0-8 in week one since 2014. Um, keep in mind, they also they, uh, they lost to the Jacksonville last year in week one, did they not? Yes. Um, week two at Jacksonville. Indy is 0-6 at Jacksonville since 2016. I mean, they absolutely have to win that game. Absolutely have yep. to win that game. Week three against Kansas City. Kansas City is fourteen and two in the first month of the season with Patrick Mahomes as the starter. Two, two and one. Week four against Tennessee. Indianapolis one and four in their last five against the Titans. I think they'll split in that, Indy. If it's here, where is it here? Or there? It's uh, in Indy. Indy wins two and two. The first trip. Week five at Denver. Short week road game at Elevation against Russell Wilson two and, three. and that offense. So there's their start to the season. But it could be two and three, could be three and two. Yeah. I mean, they're in it. They're, if, if well, yeah, they started 0 and 3 last year. Yeah, it's a lot better. Still in that's it. a lot. Look, if you start with Houston and Jacksonville after you started 0 and 5 last year, or 0 and 3 no, last year, 0 and 3 last year, I mean, you're much better position. The league did them a big favor by giving them two patsies out of the gate. Yeah, the tight. I mean, the Titans sent them to 0 and 3. Yeah. Here last year, and that division was almost uh, practically over. If yeah. Matt Ryan is Jesus for the Colts, <laughs> does that make hey, so, so. the media the apostles as they spread the word yeah, well, of, I mean, of Matt Ryan as Jesus? The way Doc the Colts. says it. Listen, those guys are not as bad as Dan paints them to be. Stephen Holder, who just went from the Athletic to ESPN, is very good. Mike Wells just retired from the beat. He is very good. They, they have to maintain relationships. Chris Ballard is a good salesman. I mean, John Robinson does the same thing here with a lot of people and John Robinson's got a good record you know how how much can you bash John Robinson Chris Chris Ballard should have a team that wins this year if he doesn't I think that the the tone turns I think they've gotten bashed for last year's ending I don't think anybody in the Indianapolis media is getting letting them off the hook for that failure last year they got killed for that Jacksonville loss you gotta love Dockage's loyalty because he still just throws flamethrowers at anyone that says anything bad about Urban Meyer. I saw a Jacksonville player said something about, it's much better with Doug Peterson because we're treated like men again. You know, we're not treated like children. And I saw Dan go off on a tangent of, oh, yeah, you know, you guys are real men there in Jacksonville. What what have you done? What have you done to deserve (laughs) that? You know, sorry that someone tried to do something different. Every time. Well, I was on with him on his indie show last week, and he was supporting Carson Wentz, saying like, oh, yeah, yeah, Matt Ryan's going to be so much better than Carson Wentz. He's rattling off Wentz's statistics. I said, well, a lot of that stuff, Dan, didn't translate to clutch performance in the most important games, which is also a, a you know, stat that doesn't have a number on it, but translates to very important. Hit we, us up. we can blow things out of proportion when we see you know, off-field moments. Or whatever we talk about this all the time. This guy was goofing off. This this happened, but Hutton, you, you mentioned it, and we saw it. That hard knocks in season deal with, I mean, it completely turned me off of Carson Wentz, forever. Sometimes, as long as he's a player, 
I'm going to assume that he doesn't have it. We all know what it is with NFL quarterbacks. He doesn't have it. Sometimes you just have to be somber. No matter, you know, I, I say that. Once in a while, you get a still shot of a guy in a moment. You know, well, maybe somebody did something to lighten the moment, whatever. That's unfair to judge. But sometimes you just absolutely have to be somber. The plane has to be quiet. Or just care. The locker room has to be Just have know, the appearance still. of someone who cares. Yeah. That's bad that, for That's him. the problem. That's bad for A him, competitor. Man. Hit us up with your thoughts at Outkick360. Coming up, we will compare answers to the question about conference realignment and where we're headed in the Power 5 landscape. And we're comparing the answer of Kevin Warren to Jim Phillips. They're vastly different. That's next on Outkick 360.
Outkick 360 rolls on. Big shout out to uh, the entire Outkick crew making the show happen today. Davey, Matthew, we've got uh, Jacob. Is Tyler back there? Tyler's, Tyler's back, back there. Tyler's back I haven't there. heard from Tyler today. Yeah, he's back We there. were just talking we about the during the break. Up. I love the you, thumbs You up. never know what you're going to... Collins holding it down. It's like night here. outside. You can barely see Davey, those guys Davey, back Davey, there. Matt, everybody, everybody's in here right now. Shout out like. to Becca and Sleepy Danny. Yeah. Let's get Becca and Sleepy Danny down here sometime, too. Let's make this a real Sleepy family Danny's affair. Sleepy Danny's been a Friday guy. He was here last Friday again. Yeah, we need to, we need to get there him around Becca, more you're often. welcome to come on Friday as well. Uh, they were just I telling me about comes when a she's spot not around. in Nashville <laughs> for lunch where you can get, uh, they call it the recession special, and it's a bolo- fried bologna sandwich and a beer for like seven or eight bucks. That you can get somewhere for for lunch, Roberts, 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 Roberts Western, Western World. Where? He called it Western World, isn't it Western Where? It's Roberts Western World. I thought. All right, I'm wrong. Yeah, my bad. And a moon pie. How about that in downtown? So for all those, if you're either in Nashville or you're thinking about taking a vacation in Nashville, it's very affordable. Coming in town for SummerSlam yeah. this weekend. Yep. Roberts Western World, fried bologna sandwich, beer, moon pie. Eight bucks. Yeah, forget about those five hundred dollar uh, room rates. You yeah. can eat lunch for seven bucks. I um, so I, I recorded something this morning. Went and grabbed coffee at a nearby hotel lobby. That's a new hotel in downtown Nashville. Earlier today, and you guys would have loved seeing me in this setting because right next to me in this little lounge area, I'm sitting there getting ready for the show, drinking my coffee. They're shooting some sort of commercial with a dog as a star in this hotel lobby. Well-behaved dog? Or one very well-behaved hated? dog. Very cute dog. I hope so. <laughs> some sort of Labrador. But they were posing for pictures and shooting something with this dog that was in like a throne in the lobby and then would run around the lobby. But this was all happening right around me. So much so that the director of whatever they were shooting came and grabbed the chair next to me. And said, I hope you don't have someone joining here today. I said, no, I don't. I have no friends. <laughs> Feel free. Take that chair for the dog. Took it away. And then this dog was the star of the, the commercial shoot. They, uh, it wasn't a border collie. Those are the smartest dogs. It, was, it looked like a very... Um, I feel like every time I see this type of dog, the dog is very old. And this is the first time I've seen this type of dog young. There are no young dogs in it this was, breed. It was, they're it was they're like breeding a, it out. It was like a yellow lab, but it was white. <laughs> it's Chad's it's dream. They're breeding it. this dog out of existence. Yeah. The, uh, the Border Collie can understand, they say, up to a thousand words hmm. of language. That's, in, that's impressive. That'd be a great dog to have as a single person. That's you more than some humans I know. Yeah. Yeah, uh, more than me. Right. There are a lot of people who tweet me about things I say on the show that they got wrong, <laughs> and I feel like the Border Collie... Could understand more words than them. Um, we have a lot of border collie listeners. <laughs> yeah, we're big with the it's border collie. It's our fastest growing uh, segment. It's going to be big. Got some uh, some words for you here from the two commissioners. Uh, so Jim Phillips, there was a point where Jim Phillips was being mentioned for the Big Ten commissioner position because he was he was with Northwestern until 2021. Now he's the commissioner of the ACC, and uh, Stuart Mandel tweeted out screenshots of each. Opening, it's not an opening statement. Each re, re, their address to the conference at media days. It's like the state of the conference address in, in regards to where we're headed in college football. And knowing that Jim Phillips was being mentioned for the Big Ten, and Kevin Warren got it after being a, an upper management and executive for the uh, Minnesota Vikings, the way that this is structured. It doesn't look great for Jim Phillips. I'm not trying to make him look bad. I'm just asking the question, given the fact that the SEC and the Big Ten are on a clear path to continued growth and expansion, and knowing in the discussions that we've had about how the ACC has got to batten down the hatches, so to speak. Hold it together. Hold, yeah, hold serve. Uh, with, and, and the way to do it would be Notre Dame. We've gone through that. But keep your own. Here is, would you like me to start with Phillips or Warren? Phillips is the new part. No, I, I think, let's go with Warren okay. first. I, I Kevin wanna, Warren. I want to hear what the week. big boys are saying before getting to Phillips. Kevin Warren, I don't think you can close the door on future expansion. From a strategy standpoint, this is not the old college athletics. For the individuals and the conferences and schools that are not thinking that way, they're going to be Sears and Roebuck. 
a one time in the says in here they filed for bankruptcy in 2018. He didn't say that. The quote yeah. inserts that. That's straight and blunt. That's where this deal is going. We have about three or four more years of perpetual disruption. During that period, either you're going to embrace change and build a business and get stronger or not. That is the commissioner of the Big Ten. Okay. We've, we've heard that and we've absorbed here's that. Here's Jim Phillips. We are not the professional ranks. This is not NFL or NBA light. We all remain competitive with one another, but this is not and should not be a winner-take-all or a zero-sum structure. College athletics have never been elitists or, or, or commercial. It has provided countless individuals with a path to higher education and therefore life-changing possibilities. Access, opportunity, and modern rules-based structure should all remain a priority as we continue to evolve. Well, let's, I'll go first, Chad. I mean, there's an alpha beta element to that, which I don't think is necessarily fair. There's also the new school, old school with the, with the ACC talking, hitting these talking points that have long been NCAA BS that's highlighting things that simply are not what college football has become about. I was expecting him to say more. What I thought you were going to have him say was more about this isn't about expansion we're not trying to turn into the nfl there's a lot of unique stuff to college. this is what it should have said i think there's a lot of unique stuff to college football that exists here that we should keep and maintain and that's important then he could have got me maybe on his side where it's not all about blowing up but that is a lot of smoke and bluster that doesn't have a lot well, of meaning to it, it this is his philosophy on where the college landscape is. And we just heard, well, I just read it's you, very outdated. Warren's too. And, you know, it, we know the it's two in power. I, I, I was hoping that we would hear from Jim Phillips and the ACC as a collective group that would become part of the big three instead of the two-headed monster that, that ain't we have. That. That's two-headed monster. And it's, not, it, it's, a, it's a reluctance to embrace the change that is coming whether you're wanting it to or not. It's just not going to be put back into the box, unfortunately. And if you can realize that and you can accept the fact that even though you don't want it to happen, it's going to happen. And even though you're partners with a, a major television network and a huge corporation in Disney, they're still partners with these other conferences as well. And that's the direction that the big boys are going. Are you a part of that group? Or are you on the outside looking in, trying to keep things together like the Big 12 and the Pac-12 are currently attempting to do? He's not come to terms with it, clearly. He hasn't come to terms with what's going on, but because that there's even a possibility you could have two diametrically opposed stances from the heads of conferences like that, from Kevin Warren to Jim Phillips, that is an example of why we can't put anything back in the box because there's no central leadership. You have conflicting ideas, conflicting goals. Everything is so different across the sport, and that's long been part of the charm of it, that different regions – have different values, look at things differently, play the game differently at times, and, and that's always sort of worked in a very odd synchronicity. It's no longer the case, and until they can streamline this thing where there's actually a governing body of college football, where there's someone who's calling the shots, there is a Roger Goodell of college football, and there's, there's a structure to vote in rules and regulations and everything – this is going to continue, and I, I'm sorry, Jim Phillips, but if it continues this way, the money's going to win out. And you're not in line with – when you say that we've never – I think the, the quote was singularly commercial, that college football's never been that. That's true, but it's becoming that with the Big Ten and the SEC. And what's the ticking clock, guys, on that singular new governance, right? I mean, everybody seems relatively content doing their own thing as conference commissioners with that NCAA that's pretty powerless. Uh, it's not a bad arrangement right now if you're Sankey. It's not a big, bad arrangement right now if you're the Big Ten. You're content with your power, especially if the ACC is somewhat wimpy like it sounds here, especially if you're uh, watching the Pac-12 
be victims with teams taken from them. It's on the Pac-12 and the Big 12 to now do something. ACC to try to hold itself together. Who's looking for the governance right now? Who's saying, who in power, who in a position of power is saying, what we need is full governance for college football from somebody other than the NCAA? Nobody's asking for it. We know ultimately it's necessary. The coaches are we asking know. for it. I mean, Nick Saban's asking for it. There, there are people asking for it. Well, I there's think, not widespread demand. Well, the problem is like. you'd have to get the Big Ten and the SEC to, to agree, agree on something. And they're not in the mood to do that. Well, they, they'd thought, be the ones to choose I it. I thought yesterday was a huge point towards that, a step towards that. With the playoff? With Kevin Warren conceding so that like he would SEC. come back down off of his perch of whatever was keeping him from agreeing with Sankey on college football playoff expansion. Sankey had first serve. And he, I mean, he said with us on the show, and he said at the podium last week, like, we can just wait this thing out. He goes, I'll be respectful about it, to be, you know, but we can wait this thing out when the, when the college football playoff contract expires in 2025, and then we're going to get what we want anyway. So do we expand now and make a ton more money, and you get more member schools in? We will too, but you get more member schools in as well. Or do we just wait and let the contract play itself out and then we move forward based on what we want without needing you to, your vote to change the rules currently. The fact that Kevin Warren came back down off of whatever was going on behind the scenes in January to what he said publicly in regards to, you know what, you know what, maybe I would entertain uh, this expansion and maybe we don't have to have automatic qualifiers as, or as much as whatever he was trying to get. That, I mean, I, I said, wow, this is... This is a step in a direction where we do see the SEC and the Big Ten actually. Well, they're, if, if they're, they're not in the same lane, they're on the same path. They're in lockstep only for this reason. I, I don't think this is Kevin Warren coming off his initial stance just out of nowhere because time happened and then he decided to agree with Greg Sankey. What happened was he went and got USC and UCLA to counter them. So when he initially said he wanted an automatic qualifier from each conference and a limit on the amount of teams – that could go in because his fear was it's going to be an all SEC. We're going to do a 12 team playoff and eight teams are going to be from the SEC. Yeah, his fear is, and I Iowa, can't have that. His fear is Iowa doesn't get in last year right. in an expanded playoff. Right. So once he added USC and UCLA, I think he came back to the bargaining table and said, yeah, well, let's do it now because now I'm in an equally strong spot and I'm going to get multiple teams. We all know the big 10, but he this still wants multiple networks. They were going to get multiple teams in before. They're going to get multiple teams Maybe in now, not as just, many multiple. just like the SEC. But it's going to take Big Ten, SEC, probably ESPN. There's going to be multiple and sides another network of all of this. If the Big Ten gets its way. to come together, yeah, they they want to negotiate with multiple networks on the playoff. Well, the Big Ten still has Fox too. That Fox is still in it. Long it's going to be so hard to get a consensus from those groups to say these people or this person is going to run our sport and make decisions. And here's going to be the new constitution of how we do it. And then all of a sudden, Jim Phillips, who's being as old-timey as possible with what he's saying about college football, what's going to compel this new college football hierarchy to include some of the ACC? Oh, yeah, Wake Forest. Come on, buddy. We'll give you a fair split of what we're doing. J jump on board. Well, it's that's, not, that's going to be the problem with a not, lot of this is they're just going to say, so yeah, long, we're taking off. But yeah, they don't. It's either join us individually or GTFO is what it becomes. Because if, if the ACC doesn't end up with Notre Dame full-time, which Jim Phillips, by the way, linchpin. he said we continue to remain close to Notre Dame, and he added on there, they know that we would love to have them as a football member in the conference. Football member in the conference. Is, is how he phrased that last week. Um, but, but keep in mind, the television deals that they're, they're discussing, the SEC and the Big Ten, the Big Ten expects to have a $100 million payout per program every year on this new agreement. It's a billion-dollar deal per season on what they're expecting to negotiate and finalize. Okay. The ACC, where they're locked in to this ESPN grant of rights for what the next 12 years or something it expires in the mid 2030s yeah i think it's like 2036 every yeah. school gets around around roughly give or take a couple 35 million a year 
So if you're going to have the, AC, the, the SEC and the Big Ten getting $100 million per school, and you've got the ACC and Clemson, Clemson who's been represented in the college football playoff on a regular basis, they're looking and they're seeing Alabama and Georgia, who they're facing in the college football playoff, getting way more. Yeah, uh, you're multiplying that upon multiplying that with the money they're going to get on an annual basis and looking around going, what, what are we doing? Like AC- ju- that's just one example. ACC people need to be courting Notre Dame every day. Yeah. Every and, and Greg Sankey said to every us school. last week, he is perfectly happy with Notre Dame remaining with their current status because he finds value in their brand staying independent. And I had a Fox News rundown last week where I used that quote, and I said, Sankey's okay with that because if the SEC doesn't get Notre Dame and they stay independent, that also means that the Big Ten and the ACC didn't get Notre Dame and the money that's coming with them in that regard. So if they can't have it, they don't want anyone else to have it either. How much does it suck, though, if you're a school like Virginia or BC? You're minding your own business. You haven't done anything wrong. Yep. And your athletic future probably hinges on what Notre Dame does. Yeah, it does. And you're just sitting there waiting. Uh, all you can do is <laughs> call up Notre Dame and say, "Hey, guy, we we really want you. We we'll send you. What can we? Do? We'll send you some chocolates. We'll, uh, you know, we love you. We're all for the Irish every day, except when you play us at anything, <laughs> right? We're yeah. the biggest Notre Dame fans out there. We love you in Charlottesville. We love you in Boston. Well, they're just making so much more now too. With, uh, I mean, it's I. I what's it going to take for Notre Dame? We kind of know time. it's well. It's, it's not just time. It's like the world is caving in on us, type feeling. They're going to go play for a national championship that we're excluded from because we're not playing ball with them, type deal. That's why we're going to have to join one of these super it's be conferences. A while, though, that would be the for that now. reason. But I mean, until then, I, if I'm Notre Dame, I'm not. I'm in no hurry. Me but, but but so is, how much does that suck if you're Virginia, I, Boston College? But I don't know. I don't Pitt. know if it's you have to join one of the, the super conference in order to in order to play in the in the playoff that we're putting together they're independent so that you could bring them in if they had you come up with other qualifier you want for them but if you're say greg sankey and you're you would be under the pretense that notre dame needs to be a part of the super conference packed in order to compete well if do you really want them with the big 10 that you would want them with you if you're going to combine the two conferences but they would still be split in this world right yeah so i uh, to me i would rather them be independent where the big ten's not getting the money if i'm the sec i'm saying from a business side of things and i don't have to compete or negotiate against notre dame's tv contract that's now included in whatever the big ten's offer yeah i mean that's complicated what happens to their tv deal because clearly they're not just joining Well, the report the report was they were willing nbc was willing to go up to 75 million but that just seems so like they a, might be a member of a conference, but they're not TV deal wise. Well, TV deal wise, like they, they would stay independent. Right. That that no, NBC would have them exclusively under the independent uh, umbrella. So th- this is kind of crazy how attractive they are to your conference, even though they're not part of your TV deal. Or are they on your TV no, deal if, when I, they're on the no, road? I, no, I, I'm saying if they join a conference, they they're they're going to get a hundred million instead of seventy five. Well, the only way the ACC could just save themselves with Notre Dame is they give them a much bigger piece of the pie. We're going to give you this percentage of this, and now we're going to take a hit. We're going to take a financial hit on the TV deal for all of our current member schools so that we're safe. And then, But that's where Clemson and Florida State and Miami, who have some power, could come back and say, hell no. Right. Let's. We're calling Greg Sankey right now, so we can go to the SEC. But Virginia, right. Boston College, and Pitt that. have to say yes. Did Missouri and Vandy take a oh, cut absolutely. whenever from the payout? Whenever Texas well, and Oklahoma I mean, go down joined, the list. That would be my response. Anyone who's got an option, North Carolina, Virginia, all those schools are going to come back and just do whatever it takes to, to get to Big Ten or no SEC choice. at that point. Or give up whatever they have to give up to. It's for, a, and, a, and a whole ACC for Notre Dame. I, I think you have to be aggressive, even if you don't want to present. The your case don't, to the masses. Don't panic, but be aggressive. Yeah, but even though Sankey's saying like we're we're not rushing to add a score. I mean, it's not like 
he's sitting back, not doing anything behind the scenes. Kevin Warren is extremely aggressive at the podium. Well, right. about this. But meanwhile, Jim, not... Jim Phillips is like, nope, this is about the student athlete. Yeah. I haven't heard anything about a GPA in years Sankey within might the not, college athletics. Sankey might not be being aggressive, but if Florida State's going and talking to the Big Ten, he, he's not sitting back, not calling. Yeah. We're going to wrap up the show and tell you what to watch tonight and get you ready for the NFL slate of news tomorrow. That's next on Now Kick 360.
flipping channels last night, Major League Baseball. Um, I don't know if you guys will appreciate this or not, but I'm I'm watching Albert Pujols, who's he's hit seven homers now. He hit one last night. Um, he's 41 according to Major League Baseball. His birth certificate would tell you he's 45. Looks and 25. he, I mean, he he has been done for a couple of years based on his play. But all of a sudden, post All Star break, he's starting to hit a homer pretty regularly. Derby worked opposite on him. And I watched him get to the plate last night at the Rogers Center. He became the oldest player to hit a home run at the Rogers Center. And I thought to myself, if you're Albert Pujols and you've announced that you're retiring after the next two and a half months, don't you just go on the gas and just crush the baseball? What a life and to get, live have a home run derby over the next two months trying to get to 700. He's 14 shy of it. He's not going to get it unless you're on the juice. And then what difference does it make? No, and no one's even talking about that. And he's the storyline. Oh, he's the, he's the, uh, what, what was the, the line after at the home run derby? He's the, He's the great storyline of the home run derby based on him being 41 years old plus. Oh, he's 42. About to be 43, I think. Oh, he's 45. So here's the about question, to be 46. Uh, here's the question. According to the Angels. If he, if he did that and he tested positive, would they cover it up? Of course. I mean, they're covering up, changing up baseballs right I now. would if I were them. <laughs> this is one I would actually cover up if I were baseball. <laughs> Well, I don't the know. Base, the baseball thing is wild, but I, I would cover well, up I'm, him, I'm not, him on the nobody, I'm not, No name has you're not, been. You're not like, saying he's doing it. You're just saying that would be your mindset if you were going to go I, out with a bang. Like, let's go ahead. I'm saying. Hutton is of the mindset to juice. Yeah. I'm of the mindset of being entertained. And I'm entertained if Albert Pujols is hitting a home run. Well, I am hit bored to home runs, death be awesome. otherwise. If he hit 14 home runs, it would be awesome to get to 700. That would be unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not advocating for cheating, but. He's advocated when, when for cheating. At, when at the plate, entertain me. How about Yankees Royals tonight? So Ben Attendee simply flips sides. He's going to lead I off. I love that. Lead off for the Yankees. Love it. What if they hit him? <laughs> <laughs> you trade for our guy. We didn't get enough. Hey, have fun with all that Bang. winning. Back at it tomorrow. Hope you'll join us for 360. Don't block the box, but do lock your locks.